started here. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a seat. Hope everyone enjoyed the lunch. Great. Well, good afternoon uh, or good morning, I guess, for, for those of you who might be joining on the live stream from uh, other time zones. My name is Amanda Rice. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the vice president of CNET. On behalf of CNETS, I'd like to welcome you all here today to our 2023 National Net Patient Conference. While our virtual conference in 2021 was great, it's so nice to see so many of you in person again. So thanks so much for joining us. And for those of you joining virtually from wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, in the next day and a half, you'll hear from many net experts on a wide range of topics and a number of patients and caregivers in our community as well. Uh, and you'll have plenty of opportunities to interact, ask questions, and engage in conversation. So now I'll pass the mic to Tracy for some important thank yous. Thank you everybody for coming again. Um, this is actually my second in person. Um, I as well am on the board with CNET Canada as the new treasurer and secretary. Um, I am the caregiver to a patient. Uh, who happens to be my husband. Uh, we would like to thank today our sponsors. Without the sponsors today, we would not be able to put this conference off. We would like to thank Ipsen, AAA, Camerit, and Pfizer. I also like to extend on behalf of the board a special, special thanks to all the speakers that are presenting today. We know how busy you are, so to take time out of your schedule to come and be with us and help support our patients and caregivers is greatly appreciated. So now we are very pleased to welcome to the stage Jackie Herman, president of CNETS for a Maureen Coleman Award presentation. Jackie. Hello everyone, it's great to see you all here today and uh, virtually, welcome. Um, I also want to thank just the organizing group for this event. So Tracy, Amanda, Rico, who's put an incredible amount of work into uh, putting these events together all behind the scenes. So thank you guys uh, very much as well. So it's my pleasure to be able to present the Maureen Coleman Award. I'm not sure how many of you uh, knew Maureen, but she was the founder and past president. She was actually the founding president of CNETS who passed away in 2013 from neuroendocrine cancer. She was a remarkable woman. She had great vision, uh, incredible passion for our cause, and she made a significant contribution to the NET community. Uh, in her honor, CNETS established the Maureen Coleman Award this award is to recognize exemplary dedication to the net patient community and is open to Canadians whose work or dedication has had a significant impact on the net cancer community. And this is all in line with the um, vision and the mission of CNETS. So we have not been able to present the awards that were, um, uh, that were given out for the last three years. Um, because of the pandemic and we weren't able to get together in person. So um, we're going to be giving out a lot, most of the awards tomorrow, but today we have um, one of the awards that we're going to be giving out um, to the family of Lynn Getz. Um, some of you may know and remember Lynn. She was a neuroendocrine cancer patient and a phenomenal patient advocate. Uh, Lynn made a tremendous contribution to CNETS and the Canadian net cancer patient community throughout her journey with neuroendocrine cancer. She, Lynn was a retired school principal who had a great deal of board experience, having previously chaired the board of directors of a nonprofit organization. Lynn joined the CNETS board of directors in January of 2019. She was appointed our secretary in December of 2019 and subsequently appointed the vice president in November of 2020. She was active in pretty much every aspect of our organization, including awareness, advocacy, patient education, and fundraising. Lynn was a straight shooter, but she was always able to bring others into the fold in a warm and welcoming way. She eased into her board role with CNETS and quickly became a valued and reliable member of the board. She was an advisor and a caring friend to many of us. Many will remember Lynn from her inspiring talk at the CNETS conference in 2019. 
Lynn was also a strong patient advocate outside of the endocrine cancer space, sharing her knowledge, experience, and common sense ob observations among many medical-related forums. Lynn resigned from the CNET's board in 2021, early 2021, due to her failing health, and very sadly, she passed away in September of 2021. She was a generous volunteer and incredible advocate for the neuroendocrine community and never afraid to speak up and share her experiences for the benefit of the broader patient population. Lynn made an immeasurable contribution to our cause and beyond, to our cause and beyond. And during her tenure, tenure on the board of directors, she was a strong, compassionate, knowledgeable advocate and an inspiration to anyone she met. We miss her dearly. She's missed by the broader community, and it's our honor today to present the, uh, Maureen, the 2021 Maureen Coleman Award uh, to Lynn Getz's family and her daughter, Suki, if you wouldn't mind to come up. And her husband, Greg, as well. Thank you. And I'm not sure if I should be referring to you as Suki, that one, or Suzanne. Okay. Come on, come on up. I don't know if you want to, if you both want to say a few words, but it's my pleasure oh my to present this to you. Thank you very much. Okay. I didn't really know what to say. Um, my mother was an educator through and through. And so this award and just her involvement in CNETs and the ability to continue educating is something that I know just meant the world to her. So. We heard a lot about this community through her, and it was extremely inspiring. So I know it meant a lot to her to be involved. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I don't have anything to add, <clears throat> and I'm surprised at how much this is reaching back into my emotions. Um, I wasn't prepared for this. We understand it's late at night. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to move on to the uh, presentation of less common nets, and I have to put my spectacles on. Uh, I'm going to call forward the physicians that are going to be presenting, Dr. Daniel Rayson, Dr. Sharon Ezet, Shireen Sori, Dr. Sylvia Asa, and Dr. Jesse Pasternak. Dr. Rayson is a medical oncologist at the QE2 in Halifax, Nova Scotia, professor of medical oncology at the Dalhousie University. Dr. Izzat, and I'm sorry, medical oncologist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Dr. Sylvia Asa is an endocrine pathologist at the University Hospital, and Dr. Jesse Pasternak is with um, the University Health Network as an in endocrine surgeon, endocrine surgeon. Dr. Rayson will now present on high-grade nets. Hi, everyone. Thank Just the next slide. Okay. So I've got two problems. I'm very bad at coordinating the next slides, and my eyes are terrible. So you guys are going to see me winting at my own slides, which... Um, no, no, those, those, even those won't help, but thank you. Very nice to see everybody, um, and thank you very much for the invitation. This is a bit unusual to just start off talking about the rarer and one would say weird and wonderful nets. Um, so hopefully you'll all find this informative, and um, no doubt some of the themes are going to come back over the night, over today and tomorrow that hopefully will just integrate everything for everybody. Now, not next slide, back. So. Usually I start with 
what's called the dazzle of zebras. If you guys don't know what a group of zebras are, it's called the dazzle, which is probably one of the best group names of animals I have, I've ever known. And usually we have the zebras sort of prancing quietly, munching on some grass and living a good life. Next, please. But the problem with high grade neuroendocrine carcinomas is you have to find a picture of an angrier zebra. And they're not that easy to come by. Okay, so high grade neuroendocrine carcinomas are more aggressive types of nets and thankfully rarer compared to the nets that you'll hear a lot about over the course of the two days. Next slide, please. So nets, necks, just a letter, right? CT, big deal. So just a one second history. You know, when this, when the whole story of neuroendocrine tumors started, it was a German pathologist who described a very strange, very slow growing, not quite normal, not quite cancerish tumor. And in medicine, when you hear the term oid, it means sort of like, right? So carcinoids, sort of like carcinomas, and carcinomas are the real sort of group, large grouping of what we include in all cancers. And most cancers are carcinomas, but neuroendocrine tumors were carcinoids, different. Fast forward, we call this organization CNETs, not CNEX, right? So neuroendocrine tumors really comprise the bulk of these types of diseases that generally are slowly progressive and have a whole bunch of idiosyncrasies. But if you change the T to a C, neuroendocrine carcinomas again are a more aggressive and uh, difficult variant, okay? Now, you see at the bottom, it's biology, not geography. So there'll be a couple of points I'm really gonna stress uh, for those in the audience here. Even when patients present with multiple areas of disease in multiple places, even if it's very large, it doesn't mean it's a neuroendocrine carcinoma because neuroendocrine tumors, the slower growing story, as you may know, can grow under the radar for years before they're diagnosed. Okay, so it's uh, the difference between net and neck is biology, not geography. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So how are they different? They're different in terms of the symptoms at presentation, the pace of disease progression, the tests we use, the, fun the syndromes that patients may experience, and importantly, treatment options and sequences of treatments. So these two, net and neck, are really treated quite differently. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, and you'll hear this again and again, many patients, are diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor um, and have no symptoms. Oftentimes diagnosed what we call incidentally, when a chest X-ray or a CAT scan is done thinking there's a gallbladder problem or there may be pneumonia. Whoops, what's that? Not an uncommon story. For 20 to 30% of patients with a net neuroendocrine tumor, you'll hear a lot about the hormone overproduction that can arise that can plague people for years before a diagnosis is made. So both of those are very uncommon in neuroendocrine carcinomas. Patients with neuroendocrine carcinomas have diseases that are, behave more like ag aggressive cancers. They're much less likely to have hormonal overproduction, but they may have problems with blood calcium and with sodium, which are other sort of hormonal impacts of many other types of cancers, not necessarily associated with neuroendocrine tumors. And then as compared to patients who may be discovered incidentally, in other words, by fluke almost, most patients with neuroendocrine carcinomas will present because there is something wrong and I need help now. Many are diagnosed in the emergency room um, and many are diagnosed in times of crisis of some sort. So a very different um, sort of story, if you will. Next slide. Now, 
you'll hear a lot about neuroendocrine tumors. Oh, you're giving me control. <laughs> I feel powerful now. Because <laughs> this is this is uh, this is quite a balance for me, believe me, with my eyes and technology. This is great. Thank you. Best part of the day. I got my clicker. Um, so you'll hear a lot about neuroendocrine tumors starting in many different parts of the body, right? And so you can imagine that if it starts in the lung or in the lung airways, patients will present with shortness of breath, cough, sometimes coughing up blood, and most times will, will, will be thought of as having lung cancer if it's rapidly progressive and patients have symptoms. If it starts in the pancreas, lots of pain, lots of nausea, lots of weight loss. Everybody thinks it's a pancreatic cancer, but it could be a neuroendocrine carcinoma or more hopefully a neuroendocrine tumor. So depending on where in the body these start, and if it's a neuroendocrine carcinoma, patients can become very symptomatic um, in terms of from the disease. Now, if I, if I were to ask you guys, if I were told you each brown spot, okay, I'm not gonna ask you to count them, I promise. Each brown spot is an active cancer cell, okay? And there's four, you're only allowed to pick one. Which one would you not want to have? Yeah, the bottom right, right? Okay, and that's, and you'll hear a lot of this, about this from Dr. Asa, much more than I, I believe. Um, so this is a KI-67 test, which many of you have had on your biopsy specimens or in your tumors that help us grade the tumor, that help us understand how active it is. And the top right, sorry, top left, top left is a classic well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Compare that to the bottom right, and you can see we're talking about two different diseases, okay? So it, help explain, it helps explain some of the differences. Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I think Dr. Asa, again, is going to cover this. But there's a, there's a formal grading system that used to say, well, if your KI-67 index was less than 20, you had a net neuroendocrine tumor. If it was greater than 20, you had a neuroendocrine carcinoma or a neck. We now know that's not right. Dr. Asa will definitely prove that. And so there's a whole... There's a new category whereby even if you have lots of those brown spots, this still could be different from a neuroendocrine carcinoma, which raises the absolute importance of having really excellent pathology helping guide your management. Okay, now you're probably never gonna be able to see this because with the lighting, but the testing is different as well. So again, neuroend you guys are gonna hear a lot about and you've probably, many of you have experienced Octria scans and Gallium 68 Donatate PET scans. Those tests can be incredibly helpful at understanding the disease and help guiding our therapy. And the green line shows, the high green line is where Gallium and Octreotide is perfect for the low grade neuroendocrine tumors. But you see that green line as it moves down, becomes less and less perfect. So for neuroendocrine carcinomas, oftentimes they're not helpful at all, not in all cases. And we rely more on something called FDG PET, sort of regular PET scans because of the nature of the disease. You'll, others will cover this in more detail, but I'm just trying to drive the point home that this is a different, different disease um, from, from what we typically think of. And then finally, and again, this may not show up, I'm sorry, but if you ju just look at where the arrows are, what makes this more confusing is that in the same patient, you can have both. So what I'm showing you here is an Octria scan on one side, a, a typical, not a gallium scan, but a PET scan that we use for all kinds of cancers on the other side. And if you look at the arrow, you see one side light bright, lightens up like the sun, and the other has nothing. The sun side represents a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, okay? And if you look at the bottom here and look at the two arrows at the bottom, you can see it's flipped. This is the same patient, same liver. On the left now, on the tree scan, it lights up the sun. 
the right has nothing. So this patient has actually both disease processes, which makes it incredibly difficult uh, to sort out sometimes and can make treatment options quite confusing and stresses the importance of what you'll hear again and again, multidisciplinary input and expertise, okay? Okay, so to treatment, and again, this is just to illustrate some of the differences. So many of you know that the first line treatment for most NETs are either to monitor for a period of time and then start a somatostatin analog, or sometimes to start a somatostatin analog like lanreotide or sandostatin right up front, right? Well, the problem is that doesn't work for neuroendocrine carcinomas because of all the reasons I've tried to outline. So the decision-making for these are more, does this patient need chemotherapy and how quickly do they need it? So a very different clinical story. And the chemotherapy choices from a medical oncologist, I'm a medical oncologist, so we have some of these patients need classic unfortunate chemotherapy that causes a lot of toxicity and side effects and that we use for other aggressive cancers. And others may have benefit from a pill form of chemotherapy, a treatment called CAPTEM, which some of you probably are familiar with. So even when there's a question is of chemotherapy, there's still choices to be made and still highly individualized, despite the tumor being very aggressive with a lot more urgency to start treatment. The role of surgery is different. So in neuroendocrine tumors, oftentimes patients will have upfront surgery, right, in the hopes of cure. And even when there is significant disease in the liver, some patients might benefit from quite extensive surgery to turn the clock back on their disease. For neuroendocrine carcinomas, surgery may still be an option, but almost never upfront. Um, upfront therapy usually involves a discussion about chemotherapy of some sort with the hope that with significant shrinkage and disease control, perhaps there's the option for surgery. surgery. So again, a very different clinical set of uh, parameters, okay, um, for treatment. And so not, 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 these neuroendocrine carcinomas are approached very, very differently. And then finally, for PRRT, and many of you uh, understand the role of, of lutetium-177 or lutathera that is commonly used for low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, and you'll hear a lot about that. We discuss this all the time as a second-line therapy for neuroendocrine tumors when they start, particularly in the small intestine. But rarely, not, not never, but rarely is this an option for neuroendocrine carcinomas. Unfortunately for those diseases, we're almost always having to revert back to some type of chemotherapy to try and control the situation. So when it comes to prognosis from neuroendocrine carcinomas, it's still quite variable. Um, depends on the extent of disease and whether surgery is ever going to be an option. Where it begins, what the symptoms are, and how bad they are and how sick a patient becomes. The rate of growth and, and, and spread. Um, not all neuroendocrine carcinomas are super aggressive. There is still a range of behaviors, even in this uh, disease subtype. Whether or not there's a syndrome, again, not really a hormonal syndrome for these patients, a different kind of syndrome and whether we can control it with our other medicines. New treatment options, sensitivity of your tumor to treatment, which is a big, big hurdle, and other competing risks to health, because many of these patients will have other issues that become very, very complicated to deal with when you're trying to treat a very aggressive, rapidly growing cancer, unfortunately. So last slide. I think I've made the case that neuroendocrine carcinomas are thankfully much less common in neuroendocrine tumors, but unfortunately, more aggressive, more difficult, rarely associated with classic neuroendocrine features, although they can be. 
And for patients, it can be very frustrating trying to find specific information if they're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine carcinoma, because a lot of what's written, a lot of the very good literature uh, won't really touch on this particular subset. And so I can uh, understand the frustration of some of my patients when they try to go online, try to find information about a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma and keep reading about carcinoid syndrome and how patients uh, can do well for years on a somatostatin analog. Um, so it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. And I think with that, uh, you're going to hear a lot more about this from Dr. Asa. And I think questions are at the end. Is there? Okay. Um, if I may, uh, since Dr. Rayson ushered in the next, I think it would be so much better if Dr. Asa came right after. Sure. That's okay with you. That's okay with me. And then that way, I'll have the last word. Is that all right? Are you going to fight Dr. Pasternak for that? <laughs> yep, just yeah. give us a moment. Yep. Sure, no the problem. ASA. <laughs> like the S. Got it? You're good? All right, so Dr. Asa now is going, to is going to present Net versus Neck, Worlds Apart. So thank you. And um, yes, we decided just to make a switch at the last second, literally, because it kind of makes sense for us to have a little more discussion on what Dr. Rayson just started talking about. So <clears throat> he's talked to you a little bit about neuroendocrine tumor and neuroendocrine carcinoma. And he's given you the clinical perspective. I would like to show you a little bit of the pathology perspective so you understand the differences. And then the second two talks are gonna be about different kinds of neuroendocrine tumors. So let's talk a little bit about where all this is coming from. And, and you've had a really good introduction to the concept. I'm gonna start as a pathologist right from the basics and really um, try to understand or help you understand what do we mean by all these terms. So in the body, there are many different kinds of cells. As you know, there are skin cells that we recognize on our skin surface. There are brain cells that make us think. And then in much of our body organ system, we have different kinds of cells that do different functions. And I'll use as an example, the gut or the um, respiratory tract we have cells that line these systems that do things like push the food down or push the air down. There are cells that are involved in the gut in secreting pept um, peptides and things that help you absorb the food that you eat. Um, we also have endocrine cells in all of the various organs. And the job of an endocrine cell is to make a hormone which is involved in helping the organ do its function. So for example, in the gut, there are endocrine cells that make the gut move so that when you eat, your gut moves to push the food down. There are cells that are involved in helping the gut absorb the food. There are cells that are involved in making hormones that make the gallbladder work so that you can actually have the gallbladder making whatever it does to help you absorb the fat that you've eaten. So in the lung, we have hormones producing cells that make the bronchi open when you need more air or constrict when there's something noxious in the environment and it doesn't want you to be able to absorb too much. So these scattered endocrine cells are really what we think of as the source of endocrine tumors. And when we talk about endocrine, I just wanted to take a minute to put things in perspective. Neuroendocrine cells are in fact the largest group of endocrine cells in the body. There are some others that are different. And a lot of people think of endocrinology, they think of the thyroid, which is a common site of endocrine function. And we all know we have a thyroid gland, but those are not neuroendocrine. In the thyroid, there are some neuroendocrine cells, but the bulk of the thyroid is a very different kind of cell. And we all have fat hormone producing cells in the adrenal glands and the testis and the ovaries. Those are not neuroendocrine. But everything else from the pituitary to the parathyroid to the scattered cells in the thyroid that are neuroendocrine to the entire system of gut respiratory tract 
in the ovaries, in the testes, just about everywhere in your kidneys, there are neuroendocrine cells. And they make peptide hormones or amines. These are very specific kinds of hormones that are essentially brain neurotransmitters, but are able to send signals through the bloodstream to distant places. And as a pathologist, I can stain all of these different tissues to actually identify which are those neuroendocrine cells. And you can see right in the middle, the big circle, that's actually a thyroid. And there's a thyroid that's busy making regular thyroid hormones that's not neuroendocrine. But within that little kind of soccer ball structure, there are a bunch of scattered cells that are positive. These are neuroendocrine cells, and they make a hormone called calcitonin, which is secreted into the bloodstream and regulates a lot of things throughout the body. On the left is a lung, on the bottom left is a pancreatic islet, on the far right is a small bowel. All of the brown cells that you see, these are neuroendocrine cells that are making hormones. And these are the cells that we think give rise to neuroendocrine tumors. They have a very common series of structural features, which are illustrated here. And you can see that, for example, in both the lung and the gut, these cells have little tips that stick out into the lumen, which is the part where the food or the air is. They're sensing the environment. They know what's going on. And then they make hormones that are what the little tiny brown dots are. They make this hormone and it's secreted into the bloodstream in response to sensing the environment, right? So you understand what these cells are, how critical they are to our function, our ability to breathe, to eat, to maintain our entire basically physiology. So what happens when they develop tumors is we end up with a neuroendocrine tumor and you can get these anywhere in the body. And I don't really have time obviously today to go through all of this, but the point is right from the base of your brain all the way to your bum, there are all kinds of neuroendocrine cells sitting around potentially as sites that might give rise to a tumor. And on the right side, I'm just mentioning paragangliomas and you're gonna hear more from Dr. Pasternak later about these kinds of tumors which are non-epithelial neuroendocrine cells, but they're still endocrine, neuroendocrine. The ones on the left are all what we call epithelial because they're in an epithelial structure. Now, a number of years ago, um, we decided at the IARC, the International Association for Research in Cancer, which is an arm of the WHO, we decided that we needed to deal with the problem of terminology that was very confusing. And you heard from Dr. Rayson that there've been a number of different um, words used and definitions for words, including the fact that anything that had a KI67 over 20 was called a neuroendocrine carcinoma back in the past. The terminology has led to so much confusion that it's hard for us to all speak the same language. And so the IARC said, we don't know if this is right, but we're going to do something that is consistent, that everybody can understand and follow. And at least going forward, we will all be able to speak the same language. And so we agreed that the term neuroendocrine neoplasm should be used for anything that is a tumor, a, a cancer-like proliferation that has neuroendocrine features. We agreed that we would recognize that there are epithelial ones and non-epithelial ones. The epithelial ones would be classified as well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, as you heard from Dr. Rayson, that started in 2018. And the paragangliomas are the third family of these tumors. And in most instances, we grade the neuroendocrine tumors as G1, G2, and G3 based on how fast the cells are multiplying. Now, how do we define these cells? Well, pathologists usually are the ones who are able to make that distinction based on the fact that all neuroendocrine cells express a number of markers. And these are shown in the picture here. You've got something called synaptophysin, which is a cytoplasmic protein that's involved in amine synthesis. You have chromogranin, which is part of the packaging of the secretory granules that neuroendocrine cells store the hormones for secretion. And then you've got this nuclear transcription factor called INSM1, which is basically one of the key um, DNA mechanisms that says to a cell, you become endocrine, you do this job, right? So basically these are all the common biomarkers 
But what's different, and you've heard this from Dr. Rayson, what's different between the tumors and the carcinomas is that there are different biological aggressiveness. They have different responses to therapy. He's just shown you that. The other thing is they have different risk factors and different pre, um, hereditary predisposition factors. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that as well. And they have different relationships to other tumors that patients can develop. And most importantly for us to be able to define them, they have completely different genetic alterations. So let me just show you a couple of these different features. Um, one of them is the cytology. For many years, we've talked about how pathologists recognize neuroendocrine tumors based on what the cells look like. You can see in the, the picture at the top that the cells are kind of relatively large and uniform. And then the nuclei have this funny kind of speckled appearance that we call salt and pepper nuclei. And that's just the salt and pepper at the bottom. So that's what nets are characterized by. But sometimes the tumors don't read the book. And sometimes you can have nets that have, for example, oncocytic or clear cell cytology, and I'm just showing a couple of examples. A good pathologist will know to think about that, but this can be a pitfall for somebody who doesn't know what they're looking for. On the other side of the coin, we have neuroendocrine carcinomas, and these come generally in two flavors, which we call large cell cancers at the top. You can see they look very much like the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, but the nuclei are wrong. They're a little bit more aggressive looking. And then at the bottom is what we call a small cell type, which is a very highly aggressive neuroendocrine carcinoma. And again, not all the tumors read the textbook. Sometimes we can have a spindle cell tumor that is a neuroendocrine carcinoma. So again, you have to have a high degree of suspicion as a pathologist. I said that the genetics of these tumors are completely different. Nets tend to have molecular alterations that make them relatively slowly growing tumors because they tend to have cancer drivers that are involved in making the nucleus change the way it opens and allows access to things that make a cell divide. Whereas neuroendocrine cancers tend to have mutations in genes that are very commonly mutated in bad cancers. So it's easier for us to recognize the drivers of a neuroendocrine carcinoma because these are common genes that we know cause other kinds of cancers like lung cancer or pancreatic cancer. And just at the bottom of this slide, I've listed a couple of comparisons. So in pancreas, we know that the neuroendocrine tumors can have alterations in the MEN1 gene or DAX or ATRX or VHL. These are all genes that we know are implicated in some familial disease syndromes, whereas adenocarcinomas and neuroendocrine carcinomas share the, fair, the bad mutations in genes like P53, RAS, uh, retinoblastoma and so on. And that story is the same in the bowel and in the lung. The details of the genes aren't what are important. What is important is that you grasp these concepts. This is actually something we have known for a long time. In 2011, there was a landmark paper from the Hopkins group showing that in fact, when they sequenced a whole bunch of tumors of the pancreas, what they found is that the neuroendocrine tumors had mutations in MEN1 and DAX, and the others had the same mutations they were finding in pancreatic adenocarcinomas. And those are actually what, at the time, we thought they were all adenocarcinomas, but we now recognize that some of those were neuroendocrine carcinomas. The same thing in the lung. We know that typical lung neuroendocrine tumors tend to occur in younger patients. They're not associated with smoking. They tend to be involving genes that are involved in genetic syndromes and chromatin remodeling. And the carcinomas, which are the classic model of large and small cell cancers, small cell cancer is the cancer that we've known for many years is associated with smoking, right? This is the, the one disease that we know we can prevent, um, the one bad cancer. Uh, the features of small cell carcinomas are actually mutations in the retinoblastoma gene and in RAS and P53. So now the real question that I'm just going to ask because I don't have an answer for you today is why are these two different? One possibility is that a cell which is a neuroendocrine cell sitting in a lung or in a pancreas, if it's a well-differentiated neuroendocrine cell decides something's going to go wrong and it starts to proliferate and it gives us a cancer and that cancer is a well-differentiated cancer. 
maybe a different mutation makes it into a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma if it gets a p53 mutation or one of the bad ones right but what if it's a different story what if there's a stem cell that starts to develop into a tumor and it happens to be in an environment that allows it to become a well differentiated tumor and then it becomes a neuroendocrine tumor which we can treat one way or that stem cell decides to start proliferating so fast that it doesn't allow it to differentiate properly and becomes a poorly differentiated carcinoma we don't know the answer. So we know we can tell the difference between these tumors most of the time. And as a pathologist, this is what I do every single day. I look at what the tumor looks like. It might look well differentiated as this one does. It might have expression of somatostatin receptor type two at the top right. That tells me, oh, this is gonna be a nice neuroendocrine tumor that should behave itself. It should be able to be treated with somatostatin. It should be a candidate for PRRT. If I want to grade it and see how fast is it growing, I'm going to do the KI67. If it's low, it's going to be slow growing. If it's high, it should be more aggressive. Tumors don't always read the books though. Um, but then there's also intact retinoblastoma, which makes me feel a lot better. And this particular tumor has loss of the gene called ATRX, which tells me, ah, oh, yeah, that's very likely to be a nice, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. In a different case, I'll look at it and say, ooh, these cells look a bit nasty. I'm going to do a bunch of stains. I'm going to show, yes, indeed, it's a neuroendocrine tumor because it's expressing synaptophysin and INSM1. But look at the chromogranin. There's not much there. That's telling me that it's not really doing a job that it's supposed to do, which is making hormones. The KI67 is high. P53 is mutant. Retinoblastoma is lost whoa, this is bad. This is going to be a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And I don't have a picture of it, but the somatostatin receptor type 2 will be negative in that. So the hard ones are the ones that are right in that middle. The G3 nets that have high proliferation indices, the cells can look a little bit nasty, but they aren't obviously bad. And we really have sometimes struggle with how to classify these tumors. It's helpful if you have good immunohistochemistry like I happen to have and I think is available in some of the hospitals here where we can show loss of the MEN gene or ATRX and say, yeah, that's probably a neuroendocrine tumor, or we can show loss of P53 or mutation of P53 or loss of RB and say this is going to be a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And of course, somatostatin receptor type 2 immunohistochemistry really will predict what's going to be seen on the Octrea scan. So having nice immunohistochemistry is really, really important. And having reliable stains and having a pathologist who knows when to apply that stain is really one of the most important parts of ensuring that you're getting the right diagnosis. I'm only going to raise one little point for some of you. I don't know if there's anyone in the room or on in the audience who might have a medullary thyroid cancer, which is a kind of a neuroendocrine tumor. We don't often think of it in this context, but it happens to be an outlier in terms of the IARC classification because this is a tumor we've known about for so many years. It's the, cell, the tumor that derives from those neuroendocrine cells of the thyroid. And we call them medullary carcinoma, but they're actually well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And so they don't follow the RER classification. So we need to think about that just a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to stop. I do have a reference if anybody wants. We recently reviewed the new WHO classification of these tumors. And if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them later. But on that note, I'm going to stop. And now you're going to hear about two different kinds of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you, uh, Sylvia and uh, Dan did a both outstanding job at uh, making it more difficult for me. Uh, because now what I'm going to have to do is actually stand back 10 steps behind and ask what does this all mean to us on the receiving end? And here I'm talking about all of us because at one point or another, we're all going to be affected by some type of disease. And what Sylvia really told you is that the neuroendocrine cells are basically all the way through. None of us will be impervious to some type of dysfunction. I can tell you that right now. 
and it gets to a point where there may be a tumor, there may be a carcinoma, but at some point in our journey during our lives, something is going to go wrong with our endocrine system. Why? Because we live in hostile environments. We call it Earth. We live, we breathe, we talk, we interact, and we put poisons in everything that we eat every single day. And that system is saying, we don't like this anymore. It's a rebellious attitude of our bodies. And that's really the manifestation of it all. So at the end of the day, I'm going to have to tell you what the heck is going on in all of these systems. And uh, again, Dan did a very nice job at showing you all of the cells, all of the tumors, all of the things that can happen and can go wrong. But part of the problem that almost all of us ask is, why did I get this? What happened? Everybody asks that question. In fact, when I see a patient, I'm asking that question. If I don't ask that question, and if I don't do my job properly, especially at the very beginning, you miss things. And one of the things that I'm specifically being asked to talk about is multiple endocrine neoplasia, which just simply means, is there a heritable component? Is there a genetic underlying problem so we can blame our parents on it and assume nothing in return? But in fact, if you look at the textbooks, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what's actually out there, and I'm going to tell you where I disagree. There's so-called type 1 MEN. It's got nothing to do with men, by the way. It's, this is men and women, equally affected. It's equal opportunity. And you get tumors in the pituitary, parathyroid, and they're endocrine typically within the pancreas, but they can also be in the lung, thymus, rectum, all the way through. Notice I also put plus plus. The reason why I said that is if you look at patients with MEN1 syndrome, which is a recognized, very old disorder that most medical oncologists think doesn't exist, does in fact affect people to a greater or lesser extent, depending on where you come from in terms of your ancestry. And in some European families, it also comes part and parcel with breast cancer. And that's a very important thing because when you're going through surveillance, and many of you will go through surveillance, something is going to come up on the CT, on the MR. And the question is always going to be, is this something new or is it old? Is it a reflection of something that has spread or is this another entity? And is it part and parcel of the underlying predisposition that our parents lovingly gave us? Then there's MEN2A, which is part of what Sylvia was telling you about, where you get medullary thyroid cancer. These are the parafollicular cells of the thyroid. This is the one, by the way, that you shouldn't take Ozempic. You know that story? Yeah? Was... <laughs> it's cute. He's, he's, he's. Um, so Ozempic deficiency is, is, in fact, is one of the situations where they tell you if you have MEN2A, if you take this drug, it's going to make your parafollicular cancer or MTC get worse. Then there's MEN2B, where you actually look at the patient and you'll see these very funny type of blips over the lips, the eyelids, and they get not only medullary thyroid cancer, but they get pheochromocytomas and perigangliomas. And typically, it's a young person and they happen to be carrying the new heritable defect that they pass on but there isn't necessarily a known family history. Let's move along, and I'm going to come back to that in a second about what's known. MEN4 is where you get a parathyroid tumor, a neuroendocrine tumor, and you get a pituitary tumor as part of it. And you can say, pituitary, why is he talking about that now? I'm going to come back to that in a second. Then one of the biggest MENs that you will not hear about most of the time, and that's very sad, is called von Hippelinda. And that should be front row and center right now, because not only can we genetically identify it, but we can prevent many of the complications when recognized early enough, because it affects the eyes, people lose their vision. It affects the spine, where you get hemangioblastomas that cause paralysis, and you get the pheochromocytomas, pancreas, and neuroendocrine tumors, particularly the pancreas. Not only can we diagnose it, but in this day and age, we actually have an approved drug that selectively works on this pathway. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Right smack in the middle of neuroendocrine tumors, but nobody wants to talk about that one. I will. 
the important thing about these multiple endocrine neoplasias is that almost all physicians will tell you, but there's no family history of it. That is actually a misnomer because in most instances, just like when there are endocrine tumors in general, there's nothing that's known. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's not recognized. And that's why a lot of homework has to be done to actually establish that. And it's important to go through this checklist on each and every occasion. So what I'm gonna try and tell you here is that there is a basis for neuroendocrine tumors that goes beyond the classic description that we recognize that you just got it because you had bad luck. And I'm gonna tell you that there are some comogenic pathways and Sylvia alluded to that, but I'm gonna try and tell you a story in a slightly different way. The characters are the same, but the ending is gonna be different. What does it mean in terms of diagnostic implications? And, and Dr. Rayson very nicely showed you some of these scans, but it also means something when it comes to access of how you're going to get the scan, why you're gonna to wanna to get the scans, because that's gonna be implicitly part of your therapeutic plan. So the first thing that I like to tell people is, is it net or not? And that's very, very critical. And Sylvia tried to show you this a little bit earlier with the classic signature of these three markers, NS1, chromogranocyte, and aptophysin. Nine times out of 10, and I can say this because I'm a clinician, I'm not a pathologist. Pathologists will do synaptophysin alone, maybe with chromogranin, and they'll stop right there, and they're gonna tell you it's neuroendocrine. And that, in fact, is not true. You need a lot more than that. So just like you use a tool to be able to tell you something, you have to understand what that tool means. Why? Because there are some instances where you have an adenocarcinoma, really bad cancer, that has some neuroendocrine-like features that will be promiscuous, giving some signal that will throw off the pathology and consequently, the clinician will follow right along. And they're going to go down the path thinking that this is a neuroendocrine tumor when really this is an adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. Very different worlds. That patient needs to be treated in a very different way. So that's why there are no shortcuts. And I have to emphasize that going from the top and knowing your ABCs and recognizing that you need to work with someone who actually understands what that language means is so critical. A lot of times, and there are a lot of trials, I'm sorry to say out there, that will show you beautiful so-called hazard ratios. I call it the hazard sign. Go back and ask, were these cases truly authenticated? Did it make sense? Did the control group really do their homework properly to know that the findings from that study truly apply and can be relied on? Very, very critical. Now we go down the path and you'll see that each of these transcription factors from PIT1, TTF, PDX2, CDX2, each of these basically tells the cell, not only are you gonna be a small bowel hormone producing serotonin secreting cell in the mid gut, but you're going to remain this way. Why? Because when the DNA starts to become slightly unfolded, that factor is no longer able to do its job. And suddenly you lose that functionality, that commitment to that cell lineage. Maintaining your heritable disposition to be that cell is no longer there. And that's when you start to turn into a rogue cancer. That's my explanation for what Dr. Asa was telling you about. But it has come down to knowing that you need to identify the cell, the disease, where it started and where it's going. Almost everyone who's gonna have neuroendocrine disease of some sort is gonna go through a journey and knowing where they're at in time and space is so critical because it's not static and everything changes. And it may very well be that a patient will start off as being a neuroendocrine, I'm sure Dr. Rayson will agree with that part. They start off as being neuroendocrine very well behaved, go on for many years being very quiescent, and then starts to lose differentiation over time. So it's a dynamic process. Again, reflective of the fact that what we said is these cells are not happy with the environment. 
they're changing, they're accommodating to many of the insults that we receive. So again, take home message from this slide is you got to do your homework, you got to know what you're doing, and you got to have a pathologist who is committed just like they would if they were making a diagnosis of leukemia or breast cancer. It deserves equal attention. This is what uh, Sylvia was telling you about with the WHO. So every few years, and specifically every five years, they put out, the World Health Organization sets out an international classification of disease. They give a code to every disorder. And more recently, actually, we were able to lobby a few of us, and some of us from Canada, and Sylvia and I are in this committee. We were able to actually get them to agree to appreciate that the pituitary is part of the neuroendocrine system and that tumors of the pituitary are in fact pit nuts. You've heard of peanuts, pancreatic neuronic tumors. The pituitary is in fact a member of that family. It's another orphan. Why are you saying that? I'm saying that because there in fact there's biological basis for it. Believe it or not, the pituitary and the hormone producing cells of the pituitary embryologically are derived from the same cells that give rise to other endocrine cells, including the pancreas and the parathyroid. And this commitment goes on throughout life. So there is a basis for it. And each of these cells, again, have their own unique transcription factors that I showed you on the earlier slide, but maintains the commitment. And that's the sort of thing that allows you to be able to maintain your functionality of the ability to deal with stress, the ability to be able to reproduce, to have sexuality, to have ovarian function, and to maintain your what we call homeostasis throughout the body, part and parcel of the endocrine system talking to each other. So what are pituitary neuroendocrine tumors? These are the ones that in the past, up until now, we used to call them adenomas. And adenoma was like just like what Dr. Rayson was talking about, carcinoids, cancer-like, don't worry about it. Tiny little thing, nothing to worry about. Well, this person had something to worry about. This is a brain with the MRI, nose is sticking out of a screen, the ears are to the sides. And um, I don't have a pointer here, but you'll see that this structure right in the middle there is where the pituitary normally hangs out. I wanna show you this with a marker if I may. Hey, <laughs> you want to prove? <laughs> All right. So you can play with it. <laughs> but the important thing, seriously, is here's, here's the pituitary. And, and actually, this is now this lobulated mass that expanding up. It's wiping out the ability of this person to be able to see things to the sides, going into the temporal portion of the brain. Uh, this is not an adenoma. This person is going to suffer for many years until ultimately their demise. And some of these, in fact, a fraction of them will end up spreading throughout the spinal cord, and we call these pituitary carcinomas, pituitary neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, some of them produce hormones, and, and I'm not gonna go through the details of that, but the point is that they are not in any way dissimilar from what we see in the pancreas, for example, where there are specific hormones and abnormalities that are commonly shared in terms of their genetics. The next endocrine component that we often see, and this is gonna be very important, I'll come back to that later on when we go through our cases, but the parathyroids, and you'll see in a minute why this is very relevant. The parathyroids are the, not the thyroid, but they're above and below the thyroid gland. We all have typically four, sometimes we have a little bit more. But the important thing is that these guys hang around all the time sensing the calcium levels in our body. And calcium is more than just simply controlling the bone and how quickly your bones build or resorb. But the important thing about calcium is it maintains the electrical charge that keeps your heart going. When the parathyroids get screwed up, the calcium can go up or down and the heart becomes very unhappy. It can cause you very significant disturbances. This is a bit of a complicated slide, but just simply to show you that we ingest vitamin D, it goes into the liver to become modified to what we call 25 vitamin D and ultimately in the kidney to 125 vitamin D. That last step is regulated by a hormone called parathyroid hormone. 
So when the parathyroids are working too much, which they do in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Now, the key question though is, why are they working too much? Is it because there is a heritable defect where there are neuroendocrine tumors that driving the parathyroids also to work too much? Or is it possible that you're vitamin D deficient? Now, why am I saying that? Because with neuroendocrine tumors, especially of the one that's more common, the small bowel, the small bowel happens to be the site where you get your vitamin D absorbed. So if you live in Canada where the sunny weather is there 365 days a year, if we don't ingest enough, our bowels can't absorb it, parathyroids have to start working too much. So virtually everyone who has had some degree of small bowel resection and ends up going on a somatostatin analog, which further reduces the ability of the bile to be able to produce the salts that are required to absorb fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin D goes down even more. Parathyroids start to go up. But you gotta make the distinction between parathyroids that are reacting to or are genetically being driven by the same gene that caused an organic term in the first place. The elevated calcium can make you very constipated, very tired, very fatigued, very confused at times. So it is part and parcel of the patient, the person who's in front of you, who's not doing well for some reason. It's very important to be able to appreciate what else is going on and what is it that we can do to make life better. These are just simply some genetic abnormalities, again, that are associated with heritable disorders that cause the parathyroids to overact. I'm just listing them here. And there are in fact, a number of therapeutic options that have been devised, I can show you here. Do you have an operation on one parathyroid, multiple parathyroids, we'll have Dr. Pasternak, that's his job. I can just do the thinking, he does the hard part. But the important thing really is establishing the diagnosis, is being able to know that when a patient comes and says, I'm not feeling very well, and the oncologist is saying, but your 5-HI is perfectly fine, so leave me alone. And that may be true but maybe there's something else going on. And we got to go through a checklist and it's not really rocket science. It's a question of having to go through it and know that you've done your homework and you've covered your basis. And that's why establishing the diagnosis is also very important when it comes to the other organs, such as the parathyroids. As I mentioned before, is it primary, is it reactive? Because that will determine, is it a matter of having to take a bit more vitamin D? Is it a matter of having to go to an operation? Is it something else that's going on that's highly abnormal? And these are some of the indications of why we would want to send the patient for surgery and have a discussion with someone like Dr. Pasternak, uh, including thinning of the bones. And one more thing that I did not mention earlier is the development of kidney stones. The last thing that you want when you've got a neuroendocrine tumor is to also get kidney stones. With blood and urine and pain, that is not a good thing. That is something that has to be recognized much earlier, and it is fairly common. Imaging studies can be done, but they have to be targeted after an appropriate diagnosis is made, just like anything else. If you shoot from the hip and you're hoping that the scan is going to save a day, it's not artificial intelligence. It's truly stupid intelligence. You have to be able to think. You got to be able to recognize what you're doing, why you're doing it, when you're going to do it, so that you figure what you're going to do with that information. And of course, there's lots of operations that can be done. Some of them are good, some of them are not. And I'm gonna show you an example of that a little bit later on. But it's important to, again, have a dialogue between the medical, surgical, and imaging people that go back to the pathologists and ask the question, did we in fact find what we were looking for? Dot the I's, cross the T's, don't assume anything. In fact, in the scientific method, if you really wanna be very accurate, we always work with the so-called null hypothesis. We are wrong until proven otherwise. Sometimes we work with the opposite premise and that's not very accurate. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that's the part where there's lots and lots of information, but you may not necessarily be aware that you have multiple endocrine neoplasia because you start off as being a peanut and a peanut is a peanut. We all recognize the grade and the importance of the grade as to how the disease is going to progress. You already know this very well. well there are some also neuroendocrine tumors that look like this, where if you follow them over time, they don't change. So th that has given rise to the attitude that 
if it's very small and if it's not changing, then just leave it alone. And that can be also defensible. But you got to know, is this sporadic disease, is this a one-off or is it one of multiple endocrineoplasias? Very important distinction. And these are just the different cells that produce the different hormones that interact with each other. Now, I wanted to bring this slide back again, if I may, and I know I'm getting close to my time, two minutes, so I will try to wrap up very quickly, but I wanna just emphasize something. The same gene that was found and we knew about from several years ago, the top gene in sporadic, sporadic pancreatic neuronic tumors you'll see on the list is MEN1. This is the same gene, except there's a difference. Here, the gene is abnormal only in the pancreas. So we call that somatic abnormality, okay? Whereas in patients who have MEN1 syndrome, that defect is in every cell. It's heritable, it's in the germline. It was present during fetal development because it was passed on from the parents. But it's telling you that the final effector, the tool that's actually caused this disturbance to occur in the first place is highly conserved, indicating that the players are the same. We just have to figure that out. And another component that I want to show you here, DAX ATRX is a very interesting gene. It's also abnormal in pancreatic neuronic tumors. That happens to be a gene that was isolated initially and found to be mutated, guess what? In brain tumors. And that's how we got to know that there is in fact a possible utility for temozolomide treatment in neuroendocrine tumors. That was, so it's telling you that recognizing the common threads of the origins, different times, different places, but similar players is of importance to what happens to you as a patient in terms of defining what the options are. Um, I'm showing you this slide because of one very important aspect in multiple endocrineoplasia. When you see a slide like this, on the right-hand side is a patient who clearly has disease you can see in multiple parts of a body. The question becomes, does this mean that I have disease that has spread throughout the body? Or is it possible that I actually have multiple primaries? Because as I told you before, if you have a heritable defect, it's in every cell. So each and every one of these guys here, and especially pertinent to the type of tumors that happen to reside in the midline because ganglia normally are present right here. You cannot tell the difference between multifocal tumors, meaning these are multiple daughter tumors from one cancer that has spread throughout the body. So interpreting, and that's why I made my comment earlier about having to understand what you're looking for in the scans, is you have to be able to appreciate what the story is, what is it you're trying to prove, and how are you gonna go about doing it so you can interpret this with caution. Makes a huge difference. Multiple primary tumors versus metastatic disease. Huge difference. Management implications are also very important. So, um, this is just one other slide basically to tell you that differentiation and implicit in the diagnosis of well-differentiated neuronic tumors. I wanna emphasize that point that Dr. Race made, which he did so elegantly. Somatostatin receptor expression is in fact recognized through the gallium-68 dotate scans that we do. But importantly, the loss of that expression, whether at the same time or different times, or having to compare it with the FDG PET gives you the opportunity to be able to recognize the loss of differentiation or possibly the presence of another cancer. Why? Because that person is predisposed to different types of tumors and you can't just think with tunnel vision of only one disease when in fact there may be multiple diseases that are playing a very important role at the same time. I'm going to uh, just leave with my very last slide here, um, which was right, if I could go back, just one more, if I may. It doesn't matter, I'll just uh, show you the slide. This is the slide that I wanted to bring to your attention, and that's the von Hippel-Lindau population. Highly underdiagnosed, especially in Canada, and these patients, as you can see from, from this paper, 
live shorter lives, they have neuroendocrine tumors, and they have renal cell carcinoma, as I told you, and, and retinal diseases that cause blindness, underappreciated neuroendocrine disease. And I would really love if there is one message that I could leave you with here today is let's try to bring the orphan disorders together and bring that family of neuroendocrine tumors with true solidarity that reflects the underlying biological disorders, but more importantly, how these patients out here in Canada are gonna be able to get equal opportunity for resources, for therapies, and diagnostic treatments that they deserve, especially in this day and age. Thank you very much for your attention. I've said enough, thank you. So next will be Dr. Jesse Pasternak, and he's going to do Paro uh, per versus Feel. I'm not even trying to pronounce them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, so it's uh, awesome to be here, and uh, really, um, as Dr. Rizat said, uh, you know, I very nice of him to say what he said about surgeons, but really, I, I wanted to be an endocrinologist when I started med school, and I wasn't cool enough. Uh, so. <laughs> I became a surgeon and this is what happened. I started cutting things out. So I tried to kind of bridge that gap and become a surgeon uh, and an endocrine surgeon uh, to that. So we call this surgical endocrinology or uh, some branch of endocrinology that just involves removing the endocrine organs. And I think that's, um, it, it provides a really interesting area because we can review all these intricate and complex hormonal issues, which obviously I don't understand very much as well as uh, as Dr. Izad, and that's why I have Dr. Izad around to kind of teach me things on a regular basis. So um, I'm just gonna, uh, I don't have any disclosures about this talk other than uh, that I, again, I said I wanted to be an endocrinologist, I just didn't make it. So um, so this is, a, this is a slide I'll just slow initially, uh, and people probably recognize those people on the left. Uh, this is a Canadian talk, but this is an American slide. Uh, and uh, and so who, um, what do people think uh, in terms of which one is true? So put your hand up if you think Lincoln had MEN2B, if anyone knows. Um, so Dr. Rizad said earlier that pa patients with MEN2B often have uh, pheochromocytomas. They also also sometimes uh, are very tall. <clears throat> uh, and, and he had that kind of face, uh, what we call a marfanoid face, which people think that is similar to people with MEN2B. Um, but in fact, that's actually not true. He didn't have MEN2B, and people actually exhumed his his uh, uh, his body uh, to test some of the uh, cells in it to see if he actually had it, and he did not have it. Uh, Eisenhower, uh, who's another president of the United States, he had a pheochromocytoma. Anyone think that that's true? Yeah, so in fact, uh, I, I think there's a rule or something that if you're a president and you pass away for whatever reason, they do an autopsy. And so they did an autopsy on this guy, and they found a small pheochromocytoma in his body. So he actually had one. Uh, well, obviously wasn't uh, wasn't um, problematic for him, but he uh, maybe it was. I mean, I don't I don't I don't know if he was very uh, what his personality was, but maybe he did have a fucrosytoma uh, symptomatic. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, Kennedy adrenal insufficiency. Who thinks that's true? That's more popularized. Yeah, that's that's been that's been true. And he actually uh, had to have um, adrenal um, uh, hormone therapy for uh, for many years, even when he was a president. Okay, this is another uh, talking about VHL. Uh, Dr. Rizat talked a little bit about VHL and how it's underdiagnosed. And uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Hadfield-McCoy feud, but in the Appalachia area in the um, in the U.S., there was a, a kind of a feud that was very as popularized a lot uh, last century. Uh, and it was a family that would kind of uh, tit for tat, you know, someone would would get in a fight with one person in the family and they would return it with a different fight and people would be killed and people would be hurt and all these other things and, and people would steal their their uh, their uh, livestock. So it was like a very interesting back and forth feud. I won't go into the details, but people thought that there was, they all had a short temper and they're wondering why this was the case. And in fact, somebody, uh, the, the authors of this paper went back to their genetics and they looked to see if in fact they had some sort of genetic issue. And it is thought that they all had VHL and they all had pheochromocytomas and that's what potentially caused that feud going back and forth. So these things have huge uh, implications in, in history. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. Another thing that people may be interested in is uh, House, uh, obviously he was a surgeon and an internist a pathologist, uh, he was an oncologist, he was everything. 
Um, uh, but uh, but he actually uh, had a couple of episodes in it that uh, that that featured uh, Fiocom Saitomas, uh, which was kind of interesting. One of his uh, one of his uh, episodes had someone with VHL. Grey's Anatomy also, uh, if you guys watch Grey's Anatomy, they also popularized Fiocom Saitomas. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the cardiac surgeon. Um, uh, she, I am married. I don't know, you guys, some people are nodding. Yeah, she, <laughs> I, I, I watched this when, when I was in med school and I was like, oh, that's what it's going to be like when I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> no, it's not what it's like. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly, of course, you're disappointed. Uh, you're somehow like they wake up in the morning and it's light outside and they don't go to work till after it's light. Like when I was a surgical resident, I never saw the light for like months and months. Um, and then he actually had a, he had a, a, th a thymic uh, carcinoid, I think. Uh, well, they, at that time, was, they said, oh, he's a thymic carcinoid. He, has a, he had a neurotic tumor uh, related to his, uh, his VHL. So we talked a little, Dr. Rizad talked a little bit about this uh, in terms of what the, uh, what the issue is of finding pheochromocytomas and knowing if it's part of the family history or not. And we used to, uh, you know, take out pheochromocytomas and, you know, it was, big, uh, it was a big case for the, for the surgeon and the team because, you know, if you think about adrenaline, uh, what adrenaline does to you on a regular basis in the day-to-day -day life, if you have a tumor that has... Uh, the ability to only make adrenaline all the time, every day, it's, you can imagine what it would do to your life. And, uh, and so we, so people would be very scared about taking them to the operating room because in the operating room, it's very controlled. We make sure everything, you know, the blood, we're monitoring the blood pressure on a minute to minute, second to second basis. The last thing we want is people's blood pressures to go up, down, up, down. Um, and so the surgeon would, you know, have a really hard time taking these, these, uh, these, these um, tumors out and uh, they would take it out and then, you know, the patient would be, hopefully would be okay. And then they'd send the patient home, but, but they didn't realize that actually we should be checking the genetics because not only would they have the pheochromosome, but maybe their family members uh, would be affected. So uh, there is a, a, a landmark paper published in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine, which is kind of like, you know, as many of you know, it's kind of like the New York Times of, of, the, uh, of the medical world. And, uh, and they published showing that, in fact, the, the risk of having a family history of a pheochromocytoma syndrome uh, is actually much higher than we initially thought. So we actually test almost every patient, or actually we, we as a team, test every patient that has a pheochromocytoma for any genetic uh, predisposition. So uh, what is a pheochromocytoma? I talked a little bit about, you know, the fun, uh, the fun side of it in terms of the uh, popular, uh, um, you know, cultural life. But, but really, it's a, it's a tumor of the inner part of the adrenal gland. Uh, the outer part of the adrenal gland is uh, what we call the cortex. And, and this is the part that Dr. Izet uh, and Dr. Asa talked about, um, the part that makes the hormones that we know of, uh, the steroid hormones and others that circulate throughout the body. Uh, but the inner part, uh, the medulla is the place where, uh, where the pheochromocytomas are, are made. It's kind of like the peanut butter and the peanut butter and jam sandwich, uh, where the peanut butter is that inside and the bread is the cortex. Um, so you can imagine, you know, if, if you ever tried to take out, uh, if, you know, people, when we do surgery in general, we try to take out only the thing that's affected. So if you ever uh, thought about doing surgery on an adrenal gland and trying, just taking out a pheochromocytoma and leaving that cortex, you can imagine it'd be probably pretty difficult. It's like kind of taking the peanut butter out of a peanut butter sandwich. You can't really get all the pieces out. So that affects a lot of people. Uh, I find a lot of patients have discussions about this with me, especially if they have a family history or they have a genetic predisposition to developing a pheochromocytoma on the other adrenal gland and we're taking out one of them and you only have two, that has huge uh, implications in terms of how you're gonna be living your life if you have no adrenal glands versus if you have one or part of one. So uh, this is what it kind of looks like on these imaging modalities. On the left is a CT scan. Uh, and you could see this thing, let's see if I can, oh yeah, this thing here, right beside the kidney. You can imagine, um, if you imagine that this is a, a cross section of somebody lying on their back and deep inside the image is the person's head and then the feet are coming out at you. Um, you can imagine that uh, any way you can't try to get it, you got a lot of stuff in the way, right? So uh, in here, you got the spine here, this is the kidney, here's the liver, it's massive, right? The, the liver takes up a huge part of your abdomen. Um, this is the, the stomach's just right above. This is the pancreas kind of overlying here. So here's the stomach here. So there's a, and the spleen, this is the beginning of the spleen. So there's tons of stuff around. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I train a lot of years to kind of try to take this out without 
affecting any of the other things. Um, and we do it in special ways, and I'll talk about that in a second. But but it's really kind of a um, a place in the admin which is kind of sensitive. Uh, another interesting story you may be interested in. Uh, this is the first successful Fiocrum's Daytona operation, which was uh, which was discussed by Charles Mayo. I don't know who's sort of the Mayo Clinic. So Charles Mayo uh, was the person who published the first successful Fiocrum's Daytona operation. Uh, and uh, the interesting part of it was that the patient was somebody from Chatham, Ontario, uh, who had gone down to the Mayo Clinic uh, by Charles with Charles Mayo to have this operation done, and this was done uh, in the 20s. Um, and um, uh, very interesting, uh, they um, they didn't have they had the general, their general anesthetic was not as good as it is today, uh, and the way that the, we uh, are able to seal blood vessels isn't as good as it was today. So back then they would basically just make an incision. And they would take whatever tumor they had out and they would just basically pack as many packings of, of gauze or whatever they could in there to stop the bleeding because it was very, very, uh, very vascular. So a lot of blood vessels go to go to these tumors. So patient uh, patient survived the operation, but unfortunately, given the uh, effects on her heart from the pheochromocytoma, um, because it's, as I said before, adrenaline constantly moving through your body at all times, it can affect the heart. And this person had issues with her heart. Um, some people uh, develop uh, pheochromocytomas uh, um, early on in their life and they don't have any other medical problems and then uh, nobody knows that they have this pheochromocytoma until it rears itself by releasing a whole bunch of adrenaline at one time and causing their heart to be an issue and other things to be an issue and they end up in the hospital. And we found through a few studies saying that, you know, in those patients we can actually treat them medically for a period of time and then do an operation uh, afterwards. But ultimately we should be taking out these, these tumors. I won't go into this slide very much in very much detail, but but there are different ways of managing patients before they have an operation for a pheochromocytoma. And the, the, the surgical dogma for a long period of time was treat them with a certain medication to lower their blood pressure by blocking one of the, uh, the channels that the pheochromocytoma um, uh, produ production, the hormone that it produces, blocking one of the channels that it produces. And we found actually that it doesn't matter that much to do that as much as we thought. So there's a lot of changing dogma in surgical uh, management of, of these neuroendocrine tumors, specifically uh, pheochromocytoma. So I don't know. I didn't. I don't know if anyone thought that they would be able to see some videos of surgery, but I thought I'd show a couple of videos. So they, you could turn away if you don't, if you're if you're not interested. Um, I don't know if I can play that. No. Uh, maybe you have to play it. Press space bar or something. Yeah. So you can fast forward maybe a bit. Maybe like half. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I made it more. Yeah. So there's the tumor there. Um, and uh, that's okay. You can, yeah, there's a, my voice is talking in the background, but you don't have to, it's, it's not, it's just a discussion. So these are ports that we place. So this is an anterior approach. So there's two different ways of doing this operation. You can actually either do it from the front of the abdomen and put patients on their back and put little uh, camera points in the front of their belly or you can do it through the back, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second. Uh, this technique is actually used more in North America, but in fact, in my opinion, I do a lot of adrenal operations and pheochromocytoma operations. In my opinion, this is not as good. In fact, I did a lot of these, uh, and I have switched to doing it in a different way. But this is the way most surgeons are comfortable doing with it, and obviously I say that if you're more comfortable doing one way, do it that way. Don't try to do a different a non-comfortable way. But you can see this is the view that you see of the adrenal gland, the liver, the vena cava, which is the main blood vessel that goes to the heart, that brings all the blood from the body that goes to the heart. And we use these tiny little instruments to either incise the skin, the, incise the, um, the area around the adrenal gland, or we, uh, we seal it. We have these sealing mechanisms that are pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and we're able to come around. And you can fast forward a little bit more, maybe maybe halfway. You can go yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, they're right there. Yeah, that's probably good. Click there. Yeah. And you can see that this is we're, what we're do, getting right now is the main vein. That clip is on the, the, vein, the main vein that connects the adrenal gland to that IVC, which is the main vein that goes to the heart. And you can imagine if you have a pheochromocytoma that's making tons of adrenaline, that's going directly from that tumor, directly being dumped into the systemic circulation into the main vein that goes to the heart. So you can imagine that it has a huge effect 
um, during surgery, especially. Um, here, we're just taking it uh, from the surrounding structures. So that's kind of the operation. Um, so it's kind of cool. I don't know. I don't, if you're interested, I can send you the video if you want later. <laughs> you can look it online. There's tons of videos on YouTube. So this is the other way of doing the adrenal operation. Uh, this is the way we, uh, I do most of them, probably 90% of my cases I do this way. I put patients on their belly and uh, I make tiny little incisions underneath the rib cage in the back. Um, and again, the view of this is just way better. And, uh, and I teach, uh, I have a lot of uh, residents and fellows um, which I try to teach to uh, populate the Canadian landscape because it can't, the Canadian, uh, sur at least surgical um, uh, subspecialty of endocrine surgery is not as widely um, uh, available as it is in the U.S. And, and, and in Europe, for that matter. So, uh, so people um, uh, are starting to learn this a bit more, and there are surgeons across Canada. And if you're interested, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I can point you towards surgeons uh, outside of Ontario that do this as well. But, uh, but this is a way to do it uh, so that most of my patients actually go home the same day. Um, you know, this week we did a, a patient with a fecal cytoma and that patient went home the same day of their operation. So, uh, so this is a really a good way of doing it because the pain is really minimal and, um, and people do really well. Uh, I can show you a small video of that you can uh, put a little bit of this way. So you can maybe go to the, maybe go, go to the middle. Yeah, that's probably fine. Yeah. And then press. Yeah. So this is uh, an incisions in the back. You see the tiny little incisions. This is a one incision in the back, but I do, I do, that's a two centimeter incision. I do three half centimeter incisions. So I do like, it's a little bit, it's almost the same, but it's a little bit, a uh, little bit actually better tolerated if you have tiny incisions rather than one bigger one. Uh, so you can just fast forward a little bit, maybe halfway. Yeah, that's probably good. So this is us uh, operating. You can see in there, right there, you can see we can we can uh, um, visualize the kidney right away. So you get into the abdomen. This is from the back. So you can see that, I'll show you that picture again, but the adrenal gland actually is closer to the back of the abdomen than the front. And so it doesn't really make much sense to go to the through the front, uh, which is the way that most people do it. It actually makes sense to go through the back. And so we do that. And right away, we see the adrenal gland uh, and we're just isolating the adrenal gland right now. Um, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, to isolate it. Uh, there, that blue thing here uh, is the IVC. This is the main vein I told you about that goes directly to the heart that the, the tumor empties into. And uh, you see, we've just, and this is almost a real time video. So literally 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes uh, to do this operation from, from start to finish. Here's the tumor here. This is that adrenal vein that we talked about that empties directly into the IVC. Um, and uh, then we've taken that adrenal vein. Interestingly, uh, you would think in your mind that if you have a, a tumor that's making adrenaline that has a hose from the tumor to the body through this little vein, and we, we, we clip that or we, we seal that vessel, the moment, and this happened on Wednesday, the moment that before we seal it, the blood pressure is like very, very high. And the moment we seal it, the blood pressure drops 100 or more points. So it's such an interesting, I mean, that's why it's such an interesting operation to bridge the, uh, the idea behind endocrinology and surgery that, you know, we, we see those changes real time. It's really a, kind of a cool thing. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, you know, pheochromocytoma, paragranuloma is very rare, uh, rare tumors, but they are, um, they are uh, uh, not rare to some uh, referral centers. And obviously uh, us uh, in Toronto, we see a lot of these. Um, and uh, if specialized teams are involved, specifically smart people like Dr. Izet, uh, smart people like Dr. Teresa, uh, obviously, obviously I, I don't, you're not, you don't work in Toronto, you don't work in Toronto, so you can't, you can't. <laughs> but no, we, we, you know, people that do this a lot uh, really makes a difference in terms of outcome, and we have a lot of data showing that. So if you do have questions about this, or if you have, um, uh, if you have this disease and uh, you you want it, you're looking for somewhere to you know make sure that you have a team that actually does a lot of this, uh, because just from you know preparing the person for surgery to after surgery to the genetic testing to the follow up care, all that requires a certain amount of kind of experience in that area, and I think that applies mostly to all neuroendocrine tumors uh, because uh, sometimes they are treated uh, very sporadically by certain teams that don't may maybe see as much. So even if they're a team that's not treating a lot of them, at least they have some opinions from people or, or areas that do. Um, and that's what we've seen, how we've seen, at least in surgery, how people do much better from their surgical disease. So 
Um, so thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate being here. Uh, I think I have, yeah, the, my, these, I, I don't know if anyone, uh, these are my kids. So I, they, they, they listen to me uh, like that. So I'm happy you guys are listening. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pasternak. I come to these, I always expect to see lots of pictures of organs and weird cell stuff, but that's the first time I've ever seen heartthrob Scott Foley on the slide, so thank you for that. So our, our experts are gonna do some case studies for us, but I thought we'd just pause and do a, a quick Q&A. Uh, I'll give this microphone up here. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please maybe just stand up and I'll run over. I am wearing heels, but I'll do my best to get there quickly. So does anyone have any questions based on what they've seen so far? We have one online oh, question. perfect. We have one online question. Are, are there any areas of the body that are more susceptible to nets than others, or can they go anywhere? I'll let you fight to answer that. Okay. Um, I'll start by saying that nets can occur anywhere. Um, we know that there's an increasing incidence of some kinds of nets. For example, small bowel and rectal nets are increasing probably at a very high rate compared to others. Uh, lung nets, I think, are also on the rise in terms of incidence. Um, but basically, yes, they can occur just about anywhere. I want to follow up on that actually because. Um, one of the questions that always comes up is, is it because we're doing more scans and we're just tripping over things more often? And there's a very important study that was published two years ago where they followed specifically the findings of the recommendations that everybody over the age of 50 or 55 undergo a colonoscopy. So you got the same large population, everybody having the same procedure, and you have a control because you will always find some type of polyp. We've all had colonoscopies, there's almost always a polyp. And what they looked at is how often the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors in the rectum was actually taking place. So that was the variable. And or essentially over the course of the last 10 years, it's increased by four folds above and beyond the steady state of polyps indicating this is not at what's called an ascertainment bias. There is indeed a rise in neuroendocrine tumors in parts of the body that are obviously exposed to, and that rectum you can imagine is exposed to the toxins that we ingest. I have no proof specifically as to what those toxins are, but clearly, and along the same lines with lung, I don't know, maybe Dan, you might wanna uh, you probably see a whole lot of lung as well. Well, the, I mean, the only thing I'll tell you is that, um, you know, we know that in diagnoses of small cell lung cancer, which is just the worst kind of lung neuroendocrine tumor are falling as people are giving up cigarettes, no question. Huge impact, huge risk. At the same time, the well-differentiated lung carcinoid incidence is actually rising. Um, so there are, there, are, there are factors that we know, there are known knowns, there are a lot of unknown knowns, and uh, we, we really don't know uh, what risk factors there are for less aggressive neuroendocrine tumors. Great, thank you online for the question. Any questions here in the room? Oh course, all the way at the very back. <laughs> Coming. I thought that it was not so much of a hereditary problem, and then you just mentioned genetic testing. So is neuroendocrine hereditary? So neuroendocrine tumors can be sporadic. They can be sporadic and they can be hereditary. They can be either. And it, what depends, what, what we base testing on is the kind of tumor and the family history. The tumor that Dr. Pasternak was talking about, paragangliomas, about 40% of those are hereditary. Most of the other neuroendocrine tumors have a much lower incidence of hereditary disease. But if somebody has more than one disease, one tumor, the first thing we should be thinking of is genetic predisposition. So genetic testing will depend on the kind of tumor you have and what your presentation is, your age of onset of disease. That also is an important thing. If you're younger, it's more likely to be genetically related. So it's complicated. So may I make a comment on that? 
So I agree with this. And the textbooks will almost always tell you if there's a family history, you need to do the test. That's the party line. That's the easy part. But the truth of the matter is that it also requires a fair bit of training on the parts of us as clinicians to ask the right questions. Forget about the family for a second. Just ask about that particular patient. Did you have kidney stones in the past? Did you have trouble with your fertility? Did you have trouble with your period? Just some very simple question to identify whether that person in front of you may in fact have a collection. It's the collective appearance of different disorders over time that really will give you the, the inclination in the first place that this is a multiple endocrine neoplasia and then take the testing and then delve a little bit more into the family history. I'm not in any way suggesting that this be done as reflex testing. Please don't get me wrong. It does not mean that everybody should go out there and get drink testing because that's going to just create chaos and creates a lot of garbage information. It has to be very directed, just like with the scans, you have to be very focused in the questions you're asking. Okay, Erica has a question, then there was one more over here, and then we'll... Thank you so much, you guys. That was incredibly informative. Um, a question regarding when I'm just realizing how important the pathology is. I used to think more about genetics and um, it's hitting me how hard the importance of the pathology. And I'm wondering for those patients who they've been told their tumor, it, they shouldn't be biopsied. It's gonna be a disaster if it's biopsied. And perhaps it's in a location that surgery is impossible or they decide not to do surgery. How the heck are people supposed to figure out their pathology? And also, I'm wondering, I was a base of skull paraganglioma patient um, and couldn't get it biopsied, but I did have surgery. But I'm wondering, could I get my pathology? Would they have some of that stored somewhere so I can get some your pathology testing on it, please? <laughs> like your expertise. <laughs> So um, great questions. Um, pathology is actually critical to be able to make any diagnosis. There are some scenarios where we don't do biopsies. There's no question. You would never biopsy a pheochromocytoma. There's just too much risk to the patient for having complications of the biopsy procedure. And we know what the lesion is based on the biochemistry and the imaging. So there are some rare scenarios where you don't need a, a biopsy. But you're right, in the vast majority of patients, we want to know if, what a tumor is, what it looks like. I think over time, as you've heard, there are some tumors that can be well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. They can start to go bad, become more aggressive. Even if you have a biopsy from previous, something's changed, you might do well to have another biopsy because something might have changed in the tumor. Um, so the role of pathology, obviously I'm a little biased, but I think it's pretty critical for every patient. And I've often told patients that, you know, I find it interesting. Most patients know who their surgeon is. They know who their oncologist is. A lot of them have no idea who their pathologist is. And you really should, because that report is what everything else is based on. And it may not be right. Um, so that's just a word of caution. And then in answer to your second question, which follows that, um, all pathology should be kept in hospital records. We collect the tissue and we fix it in, and put it into wax in a form that's permanent and stable. And we can always go back to the tissue. We can go back to the original slides. We can go back to the wax block. We can do more tests on tissue. In some instances where biopsies are very small, there's not much left, but most of the time we can always go back and give you a better answer. Um, just to add to that, I so I quote actually Dr. Asa whenever she read my pathology uh, patients with pathology, I always quote her in my uh, my note to the to the to the referring doctor because I think it's really important because uh, you know the the things that that are said by a pathologist that actually sees this very often uh, is much different than somebody that may have not seen it in the past. So it really changes the uh, the, the treatment options for patients. Uh, it changes the way that we approach the follow-up changes a lot of things clinically and I think that's that's the key that's the key thing in terms of biopsying at first um, you know I do a lot of adrenal tumors and uh, I get really um, you know I feel really bad when I see a patient that has had an adrenal biopsy when they maybe didn't need one uh, the Mayo Clinic published a bunch of patients that they actually biopsied by mistake and they found that 70 percent 
of patients that had a biopsy for a free, for a few for their pheochromocytoma actually had complications related to that biopsy. So uh, we try not to biopsy adrenal tumors, but uh, but other types of areas certainly we do we do biopsy and um, uh, and so I'm uh, I'm a big advocate for uh, for that. But but I think for, for for adrenal tumors the best biopsy in my opinion is actually a resection. Uh, of that lesion, because that will give you both a diagnosis as well as a potential therapeutic target. So, Thank you. Uh, I think I saw one hand over here. Perfect. This will be the last question, and then we'll quickly do some case studies. Uh, kind of a follow-up to the follow uh, the pathology question. Uh, Dr. said, I think you're, if I understand correctly, you're mentioning the importance of accurate pathology testing scans, being vigilant as time goes on because differentiation can change. As a patient, especially when new to that world, can we trust that that's being done or is that something that we have to follow up on and how do we do that? How can we just assume that that is all being done in, in the best way possible and take what we're hearing from our pathologists and our doctors and everything or are we to do more? That's a, that's a fantastic question, and uh, I'm going to be very blunt about it. There is absolutely no reason why, if it wasn't me or if it was anybody else, I'd say, be selfish. Be very selfish. This is about you. Um, assume nothing, um, and you're not going to be offending me or anybody else. Nobody's going to be offended if you ask questions, are you doing this, this, and this, or help me explain. The truth of the matter is that if things are fairly transparent, uh, between the clinician and the patient, then you should be able to discuss questions of that nature. Uh, where have we been? Where are we? Where are we headed? What are the plans specifically to identify some of the changes we're talking about? And we talked specifically about progression. When we talk about progression of disease, which every study almost always uses one of the metrics, is not just a matter of how much disease there is, but what is the nature of the disease in terms of its progression. So fundamentally, these are the basis of what uh, the clinician patient really should be discussing, and it's an ongoing dialogue, and you should feel very comfortable with the clinician doing so. Then, Yeah, I think we'll probably be able to talk about that in the roundtables, uh, just in the interest of time. Yeah, so thank you, audience, for your questions. Thank you, experts, for your answers. So we do have a section now on case studies. Yep. Uh, Tracy, take it away. But I would ask our experts to try and keep it to five minutes for your case. Yes, thank you. For the short lady. So Dr. Rayson is going to give us a case study on high-grade neck. We're in rush. We're in rush. We're Actually, I'm not. So next slide. I figured because I'm the first one, I figured I'd set up the whole concept of multidisciplinary teamwork because you, the Snoopy slide, the Snoopy talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, did. Um, teamwork, right? You guys, you guys are already hearing this is going to be a recurring theme. It's recurring in everything you read. Is anybody familiar with the parable of the blind men and the elephant? Okay, so a group of blind men in India never saw an elephant before. They stumbled on an elephant. Each stumbled on the elephant in a different place. Each used their senses to figure out what an elephant was. Everyone felt they knew exactly what an elephant was. Then they started talking and they didn't agree. And they were convinced they were right. And they came to blows. And this is what it used to be like in neuroendocrine tumor, where endocrinology, medical oncology, surgery, gastroenterology would all think they knew exactly what an endocrine tumor was and what to do. And basically, we were blind people with our, our first elephant. Okay. And what's changed is that we finally all see, and we work together, and that's really the concept of multidisciplinary teamwork. And there are many facets of it. So multiple specialties, right? Con cancer care is so complex. You, go, you guys are getting a taste of it today in neuroendocrine. It's the same in lung, in breast, in GI. It's unbelievably complicated. Nobody has all the answers. We have to work together. Challenging cases and situations that don't, as Dr. Aza says, the cancers don't read the books all the time. There are a lot of situations where we honestly aren't sure. And the best way to try and offer what is best for patients is to talk about it ad nauseum until we all come together on a plan. Optimizing quality care through minimizing fragmentation. I'm sure all of you as patients know how fragmented the system can be from one specialist to another, from one test to another. Multidisciplinary teamwork is really trying to get rid of that fragmentation as best we can. 
very uh, definitely not perfect, but it's a big step in the right direction. Osmotic education. If I was dealing with these three every day, how could I not help but learn about surgery and pathology and endocrinology, right? If I was just doing this myself, I would be absolutely ignorant, right? So every day we learn from each other. Integration of allied health professionals, nurses, dietitians, etc. When you have a team, you, you, you have a bigger tent, right? And you bring as many people as you can into the tent so we can help patients as best we can. Locally, multidisciplinary teams help set up institutional guidelines, whether it's hospital, whether it's clinic, whether it's local, whether it's regional, whether it's county, whether it's province, whether it's national. A lot happens at the MDT level to really generate guidelines and treatment pathways that are hopefully beneficial to all patients. Advocacy. So MDTs advocate for best treatments for our patients. It's no use for me as a Dr. X yelling at the government for something, but if there's 50 Dr. Xs from five different departments and 10 different provinces, well, we've got a bigger voice, right? Just like CNETS tries to rally national voice for neuroendocrine tumors. And we can reflect local needs and capacities, right? The textbooks sometimes talk about the ideal, what should be ideal, but in reality, in Canada especially, but all across the world, if you think about different income countries, every, every, every nation, every region has their own limitations. And multidisciplinary teams try and match real reality to optimal care as best we can. And not just for NETS. So NETS, we, we talk about it endlessly, but MDT work has been going on for a long time in more common cancers, breast, GI, lung. NETS has actually come a bit later in the game. So a couple of the key questions, when we, when we get a, a case of neuroendocrine carcinoma in Halifax, these are the key questions that commonly come up. You heard from Dr. Asa, the key to separate, is this a NET, is this a NEC? Okay, without pathology at the MDT, we're, we're lost at sea. The role and timing of curative surgery, is that an option? Do they need, patients need chemotherapy first? Will surgery ever be an option? We need the surgeons there. The possible need for either the two types of PET scans that you'll hear a lot about, gallium and FTG PET. We need the nuclear medicine team there and the other radiologists there to help decide what is actually optimal in terms of evaluation net for neuroendocrine carcinomas. And of course, all, all this tries to funnel into what might be the best treatment option for the patient we're discussing. Now, who brings the cases for discussion? At least at our MDT, it's almost always the surgeons or the medical oncologists. And the surgeons, typically it's upfront, a newly diagnosed case, a medical oncologist, a patient, excuse me, for medical oncology, it might be a newly diagnosed patient, but most commonly it's a patient whose disease has progressed, there's a treatment decision to be made, and we need the team to help us. Is this time for surgery? Is it time for chemotherapy? Do we have another medical treatment? Do they need more testing? Can't do it alone. Um, in Halifax, anyone under consideration for PRRT with Lutathera has to be approved by the MDT before going ahead. Okay, it's a condition of funding uh, for actually what has become all of Atlantic Canada. So who, this is, this is the gang, the top five are the ones who are there all the time. The bottom five are the ones who we can always reach by text, by phone, by email, um, and bring to the table as we need. So a core MDT is key, and there's always sort of, secondary is the wrong term, but other other areas of expertise that we might need on an as-needed basis, depending on the cases in front of us. In, in Atlantic Canada, so we run these out of Halifax, and these are the town, these are, these are the cities that connect in. Um, you see, we have representation from all four provinces. Um, COVID, the one good thing about COVID, it used to be prehistoric, the way we used to communicate. Now it's unbelievable, right? Nobody has an excuse not to attend, so it's great. Um, so Zoom has changed everything in terms of bringing people from Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, all together with, so that we can share expertise. So when we started this in Halifax, this is kind of what we looked like in an ideal kind of story. Uh, reality is we're kind of like this. So that's the concept of MDT, and, I, I, and I'm going to leave to the cases for my colleagues, and maybe we can catch up a bit of time. Thanks. Thank you. That was good.
So next, the case study is going to be Dr. Jesse Pasternak on Fera and Thiel. Still not going to say the word. <laughs> yeah, just just uh, just to clarify, pheochromocytomas are these specialized tumors in the adrenal gland, and when they uh, occur, usually outside of the adrenal gland, are called paragangliomas. So essentially, pheochromocytomas are adrenal paragangliomas. I mean, I think that sometimes we say that in uh, our tumor work. So they're pretty much a similar thing, similar idea. Okay, I'm gonna do a case. Uh, um, there's two short ones, uh, and I look forward to the insights from the panel. So uh, I'll tell you about a patient uh, who is a 36-year-old gentleman who presented to the hospital uh, clinic with a uh, big toe uh, was actually black. Um, been unclear. Uh, usually when someone's big toe is black, they we see this sometimes in people that have vascular problems with their veins and arteries. And uh, and this is what happened to this, this young gentleman, uh, which is weird because sometimes we see this in people that have other cardiac issues, they may be older, um, maybe they have other problems with, with, their, uh, with their circulation. Um, he also had a lot of anxiety uh, ever since he was younger, uh, some high blood pressure with the blood pressure of 190. The normal blood pressure is 120, so it's pretty high. And he never had any family history uh, of, um, of this. One other thing I didn't say is that he has lumps on his back and his limbs, like little, little um, uh, I'm not going to say the word, but it's kind of little, kind of like weird ball, balls of some sort, like balls. Uh, anyway, okay. So this is what his norepinephrine, menephrine. These are uh, these are uh, measures of a, of adrenaline types uh, in the in the adrenal gland. So I'm going to ask the panel what their thoughts are of this patient and what they think needs to happen uh, next. Can, can you see the skin? I can't see this. I, I don't have a picture of the skin. <laughs> I should have taken it. Actually, I had a picture. I just didn't have a chance to put it in. <laughs> just, just skin. Those neurofibromas Chest. is what he's describing. Uh, these reflect, they almost feel like pearls. Oh, there's no microphone. No, never mind. You can hear me. It's okay. Um, actually, this is an important thing. Uh, there are few um, clinical syndromes that are associated with skin manifestations. One of the most common is a lot of people will feel multiple lumps under your skin. Do not confuse those. Those are lipomas, they're fat pockets. The ones that Dr. Pasternak is talking about are actually raised above their nodules that follow the tracks of nerve fibers. So there are in fact things that we look for. And even when I'm just talking to the patient, I'm looking at, at certain things, I'm scanning them with just with my eyes. They're probably scanning me too and wondering what the hell's wrong. With <laughs> so um, yeah, so this so this was uh, thought to be. Uh, I'll show you the tumor here. This is the tumor right here. Uh, again, this is the tumor here. Uh, this is the again we talked about the kidneys. This is the liver. Uh, here's the stomach over top here. Here's the pancreas here, and then here is the uh, the tumor here. So this was thought to be a pheochromocytoma. Um, interestingly, uh, so these are the two different types of, of, uh, of adrenaline products. And the norometanephrine is, uh, is actually quite high uh, in patients that have paragangliomas, which is outside the uh, adrenal gland. And that's related to an enzyme that changes it from metanephrine to norometanephrine. So, uh, so it's, it's, you could think that this may actually not be in the adrenal gland potentially, uh, but there is a substantial elevation of the metanephrine, so that's why you'd suspect that it probably is an adrenal pheochromocytoma. Okay, so the operative approach uh, was, uh, was this way, and um, we talked about this before. Uh, what are the things kind of the panel thinks about in terms of what patients that have pheochromocytomas uh, need to have prior to surgery? and um, what kinds of things are you worried about? Uh, should you be checking for other uh, manifestations of other tumors or other things uh, for these patients? Uh, a couple of things that are of importance in these patients is number one is with the heart. We want to know what their echo is like because heart can actually be failing. Some of them can present with heart failure. But the other one of the other important manifestations of catecholamine excess is it slows down your gut. And I've seen patients who come in with bowel obstruction almost. They have what's called uh, pseudocolon 
um, <clears throat> obstruction, the bowel can be so huge and this can be very problematic. Uh, I remember one case where I actually had to put the patient in the ICU and put them on a drip to lower down their adrenaline level so that the bowel can actually get to a point where it's small enough that uh, Dr. Pasternak can operate on the patient <laughs> safely. Great, yeah, so. Um, yeah, in addition to the blood pressure issues that he mentioned. <laughs> so this, uh, so this uh, tumor came out, I think my next, oh yeah. So my next slide is gonna be uh, a pathology slide, but uh, what about the post-operative recommendations for patients with pheochromocytomas? What kind of follow-up should they get? What kind of testing should they get? Let's start with the tissue. <laughs> Do doctor, pathology? Well, he was going to show us the pathology. Now. The pathology is going to be for the next the next case. Okay, so I'll just mention here. Yeah. So as a pathologist, every time I get a pheochromocytoma, obviously I read the history, and in this case, I know what the history is. But no matter what, we even occasionally see patients who have more than one genetic mutation. There are immunostains we can do on the tissue that correlate with specific genetic mutations. And as, as a matter of routine, I do all of those. In this case, I expect that there's not going to be a change in any of them because we don't have a stain for neurofibromatosis. But if he happened to be an unlucky patient, we might have found something else as well. And that's happened. <laughs> Just one more thing that I really look for, which is very important. Um, how many of you have a term GIST, G-I-S-T, that you've heard of? Gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So these are a pain because they appear and they look just like neuroendocrinomas. They can be in the small bowel, they can be in the retroperitoneum. And the reason why I'm bringing them up is they're part and parcel of one of the tumors that occurs when you have a mutation in the gene that gives you paragangliomas. So if you have paragangliomas, there is no reason why you couldn't also have a gist in addition. So one of the things that I would want when Dr. Pasternak removes a tumor, that in fact, not only is it a paragangliomas, but what else did you bring out with it? And that's a very critical thing because later on, when I'm following that patient, I'm looking for imaging, I want to know what tumors, not tumor, that I'm looking for in terms of follow-up. That's great. I'll move okay, on to the... Hang on. Yep. Yes, oh, sorry. Just, this is how the MDT works. We all interrupt each other and we all ask questions <laughs> at the same time. So, Dr. Pasternak, so let's say this patient had a, a low-volume metastatic disease. So, many of these periangliomas, chromocytomas are benign but some unfortunate patients may have metastases to bone or other organs. How does that influence your surgery for the primary? Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's a great point. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, we have to really look at what is the um, goal for treatment. And I think that's why we we talk about these uh, these issues at the Multisomatic Tumor Board, because goals of treatment really um, are dependent on what the uh, clinical scenarios of the patient, how old they are, how many other medical problems they have, what what are we thinking if there's any other more pressing medical problem that they have potentially that could, you know, uh, uh, dramatically affect their lifespan. Um, and then what are the treatment options and morbidity from each treatment option? So uh, sometimes the surgeon uh, just likes to be a surgeon and they like to cut it out, but sometimes that tumor may not, may have a very slow indolent course and the, the morbidity or the negative effects of doing an operation can be more substantial than the other problems that they have going on. So I think these are the reasons why we discuss these at the Muscle Tumor Board. From a specific answer to that, I think if you do have small volume disease, what I would what I would, what I always do is get um, uh, other types of imaging or biopsies of those other things to make sure that we are dealing with low volume metastatic disease. Uh, but, uh, but again, pheochromocytomas all have a malignant potential. Um, there's, I mean, I think we colloquially use the word benign and malignant pheochromocytomas, but I think it's a spectrum. Uh, it's not necessarily benign and malignant. It's more of a spectrum. And so we have to really take all of these tumors with a grain of kind of understanding that they, they may develop into metastatic disease uh, at some point versus not, and that would, is what determines. And then we'll talk about that in my next slide, actually. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so this is an 82-year-old woman uh, who had um, headaches, abdominal discomfort, and here the tumor is right here. You can see another really big one. There's the, there's the kidneys again, the spine, the liver, and here's that tumor. And again, these norometanephrine and metanephrine levels are really, really high. So I'll just save this, uh, I'll just uh, save it and be a bit quicker and say that, that in the operating room was taken out. Um, there was a large cystic component, so it was a big piece of, uh, of fluid uh, as part of this. Uh, <clears throat> 
as part of the tumor. And sometimes these tumors have really, really thin walls. And so sometimes there's a little bit of bathing of that fluid in the surrounding areas. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is a, a concern because sometimes these tumors can be very, um, they can they can push uh, the limits of whether we can actually take them out safely. Uh, and so uh, this was one of those situations where when the surgeon tried to take out the uh, the tumor, this is not a real case, but this is a potential case that I've seen, we've seen many, many times, uh, that there was a bit of uh, leakage of this fluid from the tumor. So uh, what are the things that you would uh, do? Um, may, maybe, Dan, you can kind of comment on this. Uh, if the surgeon's saying to you, oh, there may be some residual or leakage of a spillage of, of tumor, what would you do in that scenario? Um, hard to know, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, the leakage question, I'm not sure of residual tumor. You know, the question is whether there's residual that's observable versus microscopic. So sometimes a residual tumor can be treated with very precise radiation, for example, something called SBRT, which is kind of precision laser beam radiation, which we'll oftentimes consider for residual disease uh, if it's visible. Uh, microscopic spillage, I'm not quite sure. Uh, um, I don't know if there's an answer for that one, Jess. Yeah, that's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so the pathology shows this. Maybe I'll have Dr. Asa take us through this pathology and explain to us, is this malignant? What is a malignant pheochromocytoma? What is the difference between quote-unquote benign or malignant? And how do we decide uh, whether we should be worried or not? So great questions. Um, in the old days, we used to have benign and malignant pheochromocytomas, as Dr. Pasternak just said. We don't do that anymore because we realized we have no way of knowing for sure, and you can't distinguish just by looking at a tumor whether it's gonna behave benign or malignant. In this case, you've got a high proliferative feature and you've got a partially disrupted tumor. So these are two really worrisome things. The fact that it's disrupted means there's a chance that some of it may be left behind in the patient. And when you've got a KI67 labeling index of almost 20%, you're dealing with a tumor that is really, really growing fast for one of these. These are usually very slow growing tumors high mitotic count, so all of these are really kind of worrisome. The good news is there's no clear vascular invasion, and I think I know who the pathologist was. <laughs> if he says there isn't, there isn't. And there were no nodes submitted, so we don't have any evidence that this thing has already spread at this point. Um, so the answer to is this malignant, all pheochromocytomas and perigangliomas are potentially metastatic. We don't call them benign or malignant, we just call them tumors that have metastatic potential. The plan in this case, given the high proliferative rate, I think should be one that's got a lot more surveillance than normally we would do for a much less worrisome tumor. And especially given that the patient had potential spill, I think now we're gonna ask Dr. Izat, what's the role for hormonal surveillance and potentially down the road, maybe something like imaging with a net spot, something like that? <laughs> Okay, so let me um, answer this first by talking about one of the principles which we haven't mentioned so far. Uh, and the most fundamental principle gets back to one of the questions that I was asked earlier is risk stratification. That's the one thing. So just like you're talking to your accountant, to your, your investment, you're talking about risk. Cancer is about risk. And you want to ask point blank your clinician, am I at zero, low, intermediate or high risk disease. Where do you classify me? And if they're looking at you and they don't really quite know how they're going to answer that question, you know that you need to ask it and ask it again so that you can get back to the building blocks. And this is one of the elements that you use to risk stratify the patient, low, intermediate or high, because that's gonna determine what blood tests I'm gonna be doing, how often I'm gonna be doing them, what scans I'm gonna be doing them, why am I gonna be doing them, how am I justifying them, and what type of therapies I'm gonna be anticipating for that patient. Is this gonna be one of those patients who's gonna be potentially transitioning from intermediate to high risk, whether it's an epithelial tumor or periganliomas? I should add that, Sylvia didn't mention it earlier, but there are some scoring systems in each of these neuroendocrine type of tumors, unfortunately, with adrenal cortical cancers, the same type of thing, they all, pretend to try and quantify that risk, but ultimately these are the measures. And that is an accurate determination of the tissue. The final point I wanna make, when I am as a clinician looking at this and I'm trying to do my homework, I wanna know how much tissue was looked at to make that assessment. Somebody asked earlier about the biopsy. 
not all biopsies are the same. There's a finite last spurt, there's a core biopsy, there is an excisional biopsy, and there is surgical pathology. Not all are the same. And that's why sometimes you'll see a CAS 67 that's very different reported on a biopsy from a sample of an EUS biopsy, for example, versus a surgical pathology specimen. And finally, when you see a report that says chaos 67 is from two to 15% in hotspot areas, what does that tell you? It tells me that they did not really actually do a global assessment of all of the cells. Dr. Rayson showed you a slide there and he said, I'm not gonna make you count. Actually, I do want you to make your pathologist count each and every cell because that's where the money is. That's the information that's gonna be able to tell me where do I place that patient in that spectrum of risk stratification. This one here, okay. I would say, never mind. Sorry, no, okay. I, I, <laughs> I didn't breathe. Press. <laughs> Sorry, you can. You're, you're 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 up next, guy. I got a question for you. So this so this patient ended up having a um, review uh, over a long period of time, a few years, and in fact everything looked fine up until about three to four years since uh, her operation, and her metanephrines and her normetanephrines, these are those two those two markers of adrenaline production, uh, started going up. Um, and, uh, and then we got a scan. This is actually a gallium dotatate scan. Uh, and it showed two main locations of uptake of, of, of dotatate. Uh, uh, basically, one kind of right here, um, which kind of corresponds to here, and one kind of right here, which corresponds to here. So basically, two spots uh, around where the adrenal was, potentially where the, uh, where the spillage, quote unquote, was, um, where, uh, where we have tumors uh, that are growing. Um, so what, what next panel? <laughs> I'm going to start with this if I may. So one of the things that we don't normally talk about in these diseases, but that should be done, and that is to do what's called somatic mutation analysis. And the reason for that is this particular patient, for example, if they have a mutation in a gene called RET, we have two drugs now that are selective for this particular pathway. If they have a mutation in SDH family member, if they have a VHL mutation, there's a drug called Balzutafen, which I wanted to mention earlier. It's a drug that is selective to VHL driven type of cancers. I need to have that in my back pocket when I am told by my surgical colleagues and my radiation oncologist, as Dr. Rayson quite rightly put it, if there's a focal area of disease in one area, maybe that patient can have a focused form of SBRT or in the liver, sometimes we do ablation procedures with RFA or even embolization. Why? Because I'm trying to deal with the disease in a local fashion, saving systemic therapy for when I have a lot more disease in many areas that cannot be addressed in a local fashion. This patient is bordering on that area. One more thing people are gonna bring up, and that is PRT, because this is a gallium 68 positive. Everybody's gonna say, well, I should be taking PRT. One of the difficulties that we have is, quite frankly, PRT does not work nearly as well across the board just because you happen to be gallium 68 positive. That's number one. It does work in a specific group, just like it does with epithelial tumors. Not all tumors that are gallium 68 positive will respond to PRT necessarily. Secondly, we have to deal with the issue related to reimbursement. And, and maybe Dan can also tell us about what happens in his neck of the woods. But it's a major problem that we have in Ontario because as we all know, mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, yes, is <laughs> enough. <laughs> enough. Um, I know, I, th I think you should finish that because that's really important because people are kind of asking across the, uh, across the country all the time. They, we'll no. talk about it later. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> I'm, okay. I just say I'm not going to. I'm probably not going to be here for that roundtable. So okay. if you have questions, you can just email me uh, directly. I'm happy to. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. We are going to have a little 15-minute break, and then we will be back. Yeah. 
We're going to get started again in just a minute. So if you could grab your last donut and uh, take a seat, we'll, we'll start shortly. Okay, for real this time, one minute warning. There's still so many just chit chatting. Hi, Amber. I was going to just say hi to my dear little offer to sit up here. I was just going to Oh, is that what you want to do? What am I going to do? We're all going to sit up here. No, I can do that. I can do that. Let's do that. Okay, I'm actually going to get started this time. That's enough. That's it for the warnings. <laughs> okay, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to our amazing speakers from the last session. Sorry, uh, sorry you got cut off, um, but we really appreciate not only your insightful presentations uh, or your engagement at this conference, but also your ongoing support of CNETs and, and the NET patient community. So thank you. Maybe just one more round of applause for this. And we look forward to grilling you a lot more in the roundtable sessions. Um, so our next session is patient stories. So I would like to invite all three of our speakers up to the front. And while you make your way up here, uh, just a few things I would like to share with, with the whole group. Um, there are uh, merchandise, CNET's merchandise available for purchase at the back. 
uh, at any time. Or if you would like to make a donation, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. We would happily take your money as well. So we have folks that, that can facilitate that. There's also patient guidebooks at the back if you're interested in a patient guidebook. No, 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 the whole gang. So I'm very excited for the next session, uh, our patient panel. Uh, our three panelists here are, are brave enough to, to share their stories and talk about their journeys uh, with NET and uh, really, really looking forward to, to hearing from each of them. So our first patient story comes from Erica Farid, uh, who will talk about her journey as a paraganglioma patient. Erica? I don't know how to work this, so am I pressing the green button when yep. it's next? Oh, perfect, okay, it's my first time. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It is both an honor and a privilege to be sharing my story here with you all today alongside my Canadian quarterback and truthfully the first and maybe even only local doctor I really trusted in terms of neuroendocrine cancer care. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to Dr. Shrin Azat for being there for me every step of the way in my journey. His knowledge, expertise, dedication, passion, kindness, and compassion is matched only by my neurosurgeon. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Azat for all that you do for neuroendocrine patients and their caregivers across Canada. We are so lucky to have you in Toronto, and we welcome you anytime into our dazzle. Not that we want you to be a neuroendocrine patient, but because you always have a seat at our table, because you are a rare doctor. So a big round of applause for Dr. Trinza. I also want to say thank you to my husband, Eddie, who is in the audience here with us today. He has been my rock through it all and has always believed in me. It is not easy to be married to someone going through a life-altering health crisis, as many in the audience know. You don't sign up for this, especially in the early years of marriage with little children. And I think in some ways it is easier to be the patient. I am really grateful I have such a supportive, rock solid partner. So thank you, Eddie. And thank you to the president of CNETS, Jackie, for thinking of me for this opportunity. I have been doing a lot of patient advocacy work with individual patients over the last two years. I had a dream to utilize my speaking engagements as a means to reach more people. And this is my first time speaking in front of an, uh, an audience other than my wedding speech. So here goes nothing. <laughs> Storytelling is so powerful, especially when it comes to our healthcare journeys. It's much more than a textbook or a pamphlet. It's personal, it's raw, it's learning from real life examples. And like my kids would say, sharing is caring. It is my goal to have some part of my story impact you today. And for the patients and caregivers in the room, you all have an incredible story to share. I hope that you may feel comfort in relating to some part of my journey in solidarity mm -hmm. and to feel less isolated in this rare dazzle. Some would call a pack of zebras a herd, but I like dazzle more. And for the healthcare providers in the audience, I invite you to open yourselves up to learning something new from the patient's perspective and lived experience. The level and depth of empathy you provide with your care means more than you'll ever know. And as a collective, I would like us all to walk away from these stories that the other ladies will share as well with a little bit more hope and inspiration in our hearts and a deeper understanding and desire for true healing and not just a cure. Now, before I go back to the beginning of my story, I'll share a letter I wrote myself a few weeks into being diagnosed with an inoperable base of skull paraganglioma tumor. Um, I'm gonna be skimming some notes along because I did not memorize this and I did not practice of course because I am a mom of three little girls. So this is the first time I'm doing it, <laughs> but it is my story and it is my experience and it is all from my heart. So I, I don't think I can mess it up. Okay. Okay, green button. There we go. 
August 23rd, 2020. Dear Erica, I know you are really tired. You can't get the sleep you need. You're in so much pain and you're up reading, researching and messaging with all the other rare neuroendocrine patients from around the world. Feel para what? Your mind is racing, you don't know what to do. Then Layla is up a time or two or three and maybe Maya needs more water or Mia has a bad dream. You're worried about the kids going back to school, cold and flu season, and of course, the increasing fear on the news about the coronavirus. You're worried what will happen if they get sick. What will happen if you get sick? Would you have to stop treatment? If you choose surgery, will you lose your voice and ability to eat and swallow? You really love to talk and you really love to eat. You, will you have a feeding tube? Will it be temporary or permanently? Will you have a trach? Will you look like you had a stroke? Will you have Horner's syndrome? Will you lose hearing on your left side? Will your left arm be limp forever? How would you even have time to go through rehab? You have no extra time to spare. And how awful would it be for the kids to see you this way? Even if you could find someone to operate and they can't get it all, would it grow back? You don't believe that radiation can shrink it down. It won't help the mass effect pain, but could it stop your symptoms or halt the growth? And what about the late toxicities and side effects? You still have so much life to live. Do you really wanna risk a secondary radiation-induced cancer? Would proton beam help spare normal tissue? Are you even eligible for that at 35? Would OHIP cover you to go get it? It's your worst nightmare to have radiation on your head and neck, and it won't take this mass out of your head. You want Tabitha evicted, and you have to find a way. You wish you could speed up the genetic testing. God forbid you've passed this down to your girls. That guilt will eat you alive. Can you get the scans and tests you really need to get the full picture of your diagnosis? This is so rare. What if there are more tumors in your body? They are sneaky and highly misunderstood. You're unsure if you can get the clinical trial you found in the States at the NIH because of COVID. They aren't accepting international patients due to travel restrictions. They also told you, you couldn't be breastfeeding if you want to enroll. You can't stop breastfeeding, she's only four months old. The other girls got 18 months, but you know how much your body needs you right now. No matter what you choose, treatments are going to be demanding. You will need stronger pain management, but you think Layla needs your milk more, then you need the pain management. You feel selfish and guilty for even thinking about weaning her. Deep down, you know she needs your mo her mother to be healthy. All three of them do. The girls need you to battle this with all that you can, with everything you have, so that you can be there for them until you're old or gray. The plan was to live a long, full, healthy life and die very quickly at the end. Not a slow burn on borrowed time, high on painkillers. You worry about Eddie. Marriage is hard enough as it is with three kids, four and under, in a global pandemic, without nearby family or a village of support. How can he handle this with you? Can you make it through this together? He is so strong and steady, thank God, but this is hard. You worry about the girls. You're fighting through the pain, trying to have the best days possible with them. You put on a mask and cape every day taking it off when they're only fast asleep. You have superpowers. Your pain is basically invisible. You hide it so well. But they can sense something is up. They are being extra kind and thoughtful, melting your heart and bringing you to tears. It's like they can read your mind. Those tender exchanges are better than any meditation or medication but you know in your heart, you're gonna to have to share a kid-friendly version of the truth someday, very soon. I know you're scared, but you're actually doing a really good job. I know no one tells you, but you really are, and you've got this. You will get through this one day at a time, one scan, one test, one treatment. Be gentle with yourself. It's okay to cry. Let those tears out. Let yourself break, fall apart, and then pick yourself back up Dust yourself off and get back out there. Find the good doctors, the ones who look at you like a whole person with a before and an after, 
this diagnosis. Functional medicine practitioners who consider the full picture of your mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. The ones who believe you and they believe in you. Find the complementary medicines. Drink more water, go to bed earlier, get fresh air, move your body, get in some nourishing meals, even if you're not capable of cooking them. Move your body a lot and accept the help. Just say yes, okay? There's no medal for doing this alone. Just keep going, keep living. You're surviving now, but you will thrive again on the other side of this mountain. You're stronger than you'll know, you see. A few days pass and I write a little bit more. This time will be different. This time I will help myself. I will find a way to get through this painful, debilitating ball of pent up pain out of my body. I will do the work. I will learn why it came. I will grow. I will be courageous and hold strong. I will persevere and believe in myself and I will form a team of people who truly care and believe in me. I will unearth painful truths and discover wounds that were never fully healed. I will be open to receiving emotional support and connection. And I will love my children even harder. I will come back home to myself. I will share lessons along the way and spread messages of advocacy, hope, and faith over fear. I will be grateful for it all. I won't need this ball of painful fire anymore to remind me how to take care of myself as a whole. To shed limiting beliefs and outdated burdens, I will fight for myself every step of the way. I am strong, confident, competent, brave, and fearless, and I will overcome the obstacles. I will advocate so hard for what I want and what I deserve. I will make them question their limitations and decisions based on policy, funding, and fear. I will find the healers and I will find the best surgeon to do the impossible. They will be the most experienced in this region and have the confidence and unconditional courage and faith that I have in myself. I will conquer both sides of the mountain and I will leave a trail. I will clear the bush, flatten the earth, widen the path, and put up signs all along the way. Signs of hope and encouragement. Detailed maps of pit stops and roadblocks with faith over fear billboards along the way. My story will trailblaze this inoperable diagnosis, and it will be part of someone else's survival guide. Inoperable just meant unstoppable. It will be hard, but it will finally be the right kind of hard. It's always darkest before the dawn. I will be the light when it's dark. I will be the light when there is none and I won't stop until I'm free. A cure is never guaranteed. I may never be cured, but my God, I will heal. Oops. So this is my why. Uh, these are my girls when I was diagnosed. Um, so my newborn was three and a half months old and my middle had just turned three and my eldest was four and a half. And I'm not quite sure that I would have done everything I did if it wasn't for them. There is no love like a mother's love. You would die for your children, but would you live for them? So here I am before I was diagnosed. Um, and I had been having symptoms that were seemingly not related for about 10 years, a whole decade before my diagnosis. I was having severe GI attacks and headaches, dizziness, nausea. Um, and then came along a chirping heartbeat that I only heard in my ear when I was pregnant. And vertigo episodes got more severe and increasing in occurrence, blurred visions, migraines, especially after working out. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant again with baby number three. And suddenly all of my symptoms turned into, oh, you're pregnant, you're breastfeeding. Are you stressed? You're a young mom. Are you sleeping? Do you wanna try some anxiety medication? Do you wanna download a meditation app? No, I, I'm not stressed. I'm not anxious, I'm cool. I do meditate, I do yoga, something's really wrong. So I asked for some heart-halter uh, heart 
and but nothing came up. I checked out as just a healthy young mom who needed to get more sleep. Then when Layla was born, everything got better when she came out. The hospital was a very quiet, peaceful place to have a baby in 2020. Um, once we got home, I got about three months of feeling good. I got a fourth trimester really to recover and rest as much as one can do with two other kids. But after I passed the fourth trimester mark, I started to not feel very well again. Um, I started getting dizzy, nauseous, lightheaded, and um, I tried my first workout and I went down to my husband's office after I did that and I said I'm not feeling well at all I think I'm coming down with a flu maybe could we finally have COVID I don't know the next few days things got worse my head started to hurt really badly my head and neck started to hurt really badly I was in so much pain but it was really hard to see a doctor at that time it was really hard to even get a virtual appointment nobody's going to their doctor in August 2020, it's virtual or the emergency department, and you're not going to the ER unless you're dying or need a ventilator. Um, so I put my credit card into Maple, which was a new app at the time, and I did a virtual doctor's appointment. I wrote up my symptoms and I waited for the doctor to show up on the screen. From what I had Googled, I was having a severe tension headache with a migraine. It was reminiscent of the ones I'd had while I was pregnant, but the last two weeks it was getting stronger and they weren't stopping. And I was wondering, am I dehydrated? Is it just from breastfeeding? Is my posture pure? Maybe I just need a massage. Um, so I was prescribed anti-migraine medication and I ordered myself a massager from Amazon. And I started those two things knowing that that probably wasn't gonna be the solution. Um, a few days later, I went for another doctor's appointment virtually and the doctor said to me, you need to get to the emergency department now. You're having the worst headache of your life. You need to go right now. How can I go? I can't go to the emergency department right now. It's COVID. Nobody's going to the hospital. She said, you really need to go right now. So when I got there, when I was with the triage nurse, I said, I'm having the worst headache of my life. And I wouldn't be here unless I thought it was very serious. So she booked the scanner right away, and without even seeing a doctor, I went right for a CT scan. I said to the tech, I'm actually a tech too, so can you kind of give me like a wink or a nut or a nod if there's something there? And after the scan was over, he said, does your neck hurt too? And I said, yeah, really badly. He said, I think I saw something on the inferior border of your scan, but they only ordered a head scan, so I'm going to get them to order a head and neck scan next. Unfortunately, the nurses that were working with me said, you can't go in for that scan with the contrast, you're breastfeeding. What? Come on, it's 2020, of course I can. Well, if you, do you want me to pump? Yes, please, you have to, ha you have to do a pump right now. So I waited for a pump to come. The CT staff were leaving, it was almost midnight. They made me pump my milk before I got the scan, but fortunately I was able to do the scan with the contrast. And sure enough, I left with a diagnosis. I left Michael Guerin Hospital with a preliminary report. There's a mass close to your carotid bifurcation and it's raising suspicion of a left carotid paraganglioma. It can be associated with headache, but no other intracranial could, patient could acutely see in this presentation. Semi-urgent elective MRI is requested and you have a tentative appointment booked tomorrow. I go home and I Google paraganglioma and other differential diagnosis. I learn I am a zebra. The phone rings the next day and the doctor says he can't look at me because he doesn't know these types of tumors and my referral will be sent back to someone else and I should expect a call in the next few days. Then my chart is passed around like a hot potato, which I'm sure most of you guys have experienced at one point in time or another. Nobody can help me, nobody sees this. I learn what it is to be rare and I learn that I am a zebra. After many ER visits, on recommendations from my family doctors, I finally have some appointments lined up. I am back where I trained as a student now. What a trip. I am now the patient. 
I am mistaken for staff at the hospital. Excuse me, staff, come to this lineup, yells the screener from behind the layers of plexiglass and masks. Ah, uh, no, I'm a patient today. I have to go to all my appointments alone because of COVID policies, and I bring home a big orange jug. I instruct the kids that it is not juice. I get more blood work than I've ever had in my lifetime. I see all of the elderly cancer patients without their supports. They have no advocate, no one to hold their hand, no one to help them in the elevator ask questions, and all of the beautiful resources that I, I knew as a, as a healthcare practitioner, I couldn't suggest these for myself because they were closed for COVID. It was a very lonely and depressing time, and we aren't supposed to go, these, go through these things alone. Here I am as a student, I was planning out a mock radiation therapy treatment for a head and neck patient. I jokingly put on the mask with my friend who we were both training at Princess Margaret Hospital in our clinical rotations. The head and neck unit is my least favorite unit. It really hurts to see the patients waste away before they finally get their feeding tube put in. They shrink, they get pale, they get tired, their mouths get sores and dry. They can't eat, they can't speak very well. We make them suffer so much. I never want to get head and neck radiation. I would rather die. Well, I'm told that my tumor is inoperable. The door is closed. The door is closed again and again and again and again. The door is now locked and it's even boarded shut. I tried everyone. I tried every doctor I could find in Canada and Toronto and even lots across in the US. We just don't do this anymore. As a group, we've decided it's not worth the risk. But what if I want to? What if I want to take the risk? You'd probably find someone to operate. Someone will tell you they will take it out, but they just want your money. They don't care what you look like afterwards. They don't care what your life is like afterwards. Do not do it. Radiation has excellent local control. Well, how old are the patients that you're radiating? 60, 70, and 80. Well, I'm 35 and I am symptomatic. Radiation might be a good option if I didn't have these symptoms and I didn't have a long life ahead of me. But the radiation appointments were booked and without me even consenting. My dental appointment was booked, my mass fitting appointment was booked. And I said, stop, I'm not doing radiation. And if I do, I need to at least try to get proton beam I want to survive and I want to thrive. So in the meantime, I need some pain relief and I need to find someone who understands what I'm dealing with here. I need to figure out if I had to have a genetic mutation and I need the gallium PET scan. What if it's not even a paraganglioma? If I can't biopsy it and I can't do the normal workup for that we do for normal tumors, how do I know that this is even a paraganglioma? I ask to be referred to Dr. Izzat. We meet at PMH and he knows what he's talking about. He will try to get me the PET scan and there are treatment options if my tumor lights up. I get my MRI, I get my gallium dotatate PET scan and my tumor, as you can see, lights up like a Christmas tree. I then find out I have the SDHC mutation and I find, unfortunately, that two of my children have it as well. They have inherited that from me, which is probably a mother's worst nightmare. Dr. Izat calls me after the results of my PET scan. Can you come now? He says, we might be able to try something. I go and we discuss lanreotide. It might help the pain and symptom relief. It's worth a try. But there's a caveat. You have to stop breastfeeding. I myself read all of the trials. I don't feel comfortable nursing with it being excreted in the milk. So I nursed my baby girl for the last time that night. She was taking bottles of pump milk when I was out at my, my appointments, no problem, but it was always someone else. And unless you've breastfed, you don't know how it feels. It's a peace and serenity. It's a quiet space and a rush of happy hormones. And it's a way of feeling like you're doing something useful when you're otherwise feeling pretty useless and out of commission. So I was wondering, do I really need this pain relief? Should I put off trying lanreotide? I try giving her a bottle of milk myself and I cry a lot. This is very hard, but I am ready to try lanreotide. It's almost $3,000 per shot if you've ever taken it. 
I do have coverage, but I'm wondering, what about the people who don't have coverage? How are they affording to pay for this medication? The inequities in the healthcare system are getting to be apparent now. I am English, I am white, I am competent, I am confident, I have a medical background, I have money to pay for parking at Princess Margaret, I have benefits for meds, I have support at home, and I don't have to work right now. But what about other people? What are they doing? How are they navigating this? Who is supporting them? We are all in the same storm, but we are in very different boats. And that's what COVID felt like to me too. Same storm, very different boats. This is balance testing, if any of you have had it. So I was getting increasing episodes of vertigo, swooshing sounds. It sounded like a helicopter was landing in my head every day. I knew it was my tumor, but a few people didn't think so. So I had to go through this balance testing and it was not fun. It was torturous. If you've gone through it, you know. After a month or two of lanreotide injections, my GI symptoms got really bad. The nausea was debilitating and I was weak and sick. I had to go to the hospital and nobody knew what a paraganglioma was there. Nobody even knew what lanreotide was. I had to repeat my story over and over again to every nurse and doctor I came into contact with. And that was frustrating, time consuming, and made me feel even more rare. And I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think some other people have felt the same way before. While in the hospital, I saw a lot more problems. What are we feeding our patients? How can we heal if we have to eat this? I can Uber eat healthy food, and I have friends dropping off food, but I'm just wondering about what everyone else is eating. There's not a lot I can do, so I order the staff some dinner, and I hope that that helps. And being an inpatient uh, over the Christmas holidays during COVID 2020 was not a fun experience. I had to FaceTime my children and husband, and um, I broke some COVID rules too. This is a picture of a 92 year old woman hand who was dying in her hospital bed beside me. She had no family around, no support, um, and I was able to get her husband's and daughter's phone numbers. So I called them and they spoke briefly and I'll never forget his voice saying, I love you, my dear, I hope I see you soon. But unfortunately, I'm not quite sure that they saw each other before she passed away. Um, I switched over from lanreotide to octreotide. It was cheaper, but much less convenient and a lot less side effects. And this was the beside my bedside every night, full of pain medications and needles, and I got very, very swollen. This is after a 911 call. Um, if you've had one of these episodes before, you know kind of what it feels like. It feels like a stroke or a heart attack, but it's not what it is. And then this is back home. Unfortunately, my dog seemed to take some of my pain away. I don't know if you guys have any pets that have taken on some of that pain, yes. So my 15 year old girl took on some of my pain and she decided it was her time to pass away. Um, and it was at that time I kind of started to question, am I truly even living anymore in this kind of pain? My symptoms were out of control and I didn't look sick. And that, that was a really hard thing to have this invisible pain. And again, I see a lot of heads nodding. I know a lot of you know what this feels like right now. And all of this really prompted me to question, should I go get the surgery I know I really want and need? And these are some of my friends that I would meet for socially distanced coffee and drinks. And they gifted me with this locket of a picture with my three girls. And it was then that I said, maybe it's time to go. Maybe it's time to go get surgery. I reached out to Dr. Liu, who's in Rutgers in New Jersey, and set a surgery date. We had been in touch for many months before, and he gave no pressure and was just kind and caring and listened and was a shoulder for me. And we booked the surgery for less than a month after that phone call. I was scared, I was excited, and I was ready. I'm trying to figure out if, you've, if I can even travel now because the city keeps closing down as does the country, but I'm gonna try my best to go. 
My friends gathered together at night to make some bracelets for our friends and family to wear while we went away. We created Team Erica, and it was formed by Dr. Liu as well. We beaded bracelets and we sent them all around the world. I told my kids what I was about to do. I prepared them and coached them and, and told them what they would be expecting when mommy came home from surgery. I explained that I would look like I had a very cool haircut and that I needed to get to the best doctor to get this tumor out of my head. This was my daughter's first birthday, April 24th, 2020. I was flying out the next day for surgery. I had a really hard time singing happy birthday that night because it was the last time I might ever sing again. I snap pictures and takes videos and it's time to say goodbye. I'm crying, I pack up, I don't wanna leave, but it's time to go. In the morning, I'm ready. I say my goodbyes, I head to Pearson. Customs is a breeze. There's nobody there. <laughs> The hotel is quite far away from the hospitals because of COVID. And I decide instead of going in Ubers over and over again, I'm gonna rent myself a red Camaro without a roof. And I drive around singing at the top of my lungs and preparing myself for a very big surgery. My friends had a healing energy circle a few nights before my surgery. It was incredibly special and powerful. My husband flies in, I pick him up in the convertible and we go for a fancy dinner. It's really strange to think that it could be our last dinner. Um, and our last dinner is actually just pizza and beers under a bridge and it was perfect. I am at the top of the mountain and I made it and I did it and I'm ready for surgery. I'm in pre-op alone here and I see this zebra on the bracelet and I think it's a pretty good sign for us zebra patients. This is after my embolization. As you can see, it was extremely successful. This is me after the embolization. Uh, Tabitha, which was my tumor, was pretty pissed about the embolization because we cut off her blood supply. My surgery was in fact miraculous. This is the before and after. This is Tabitha, the tumor, and it's exactly how I imagined her. These days are all kind of a blur, um, but I got through them <laughs> with Eddie by my side. It was in fact a miraculous surgery. My cranial nerves were all spared. My surgeon almost gave up near the end of my surgery, but he found a secret plane of dissection to peel the tumor off the nerves. And there was a Toronto neurophysiological monitoring tech watching my nerves closely the whole way. This is a picture of the hospital board where I kept track of my pain medications and the time of day it was. It's Mother's Day and I know I'm gonna get out of here soon and get back to my kids. Uh, this is what you eat after this kind of neurosurgery. I was back on pureed foods for many weeks and it wasn't easy. Um, it's very hard to get out of bed and it's very hard to walk and my lungs kind of go down. So I really needed to dig deep here. Dr. Liu kicked me out of the hospital after two weeks. He said, it's better to go to this, the hotel and home. It's time for you to recover at home and start moving. The swelling gets really bad and they're unsure if I'm going to need to go back into the operating room. Thankfully, I don't have to. I go back to the hotel, I shower, I try to get the mats out of my hair, I put on some makeup and we go out for some dinner. And I will never forget how good it felt to eat real food after not eating for about three weeks. And that's the, the typical food that somebody can eat after they're learning how to swallow again. We get our COVID tests and we're trying to figure out how to get home. I can't fly because of the ear pain. So we decide we're gonna Bonnie and Clyde that rental car across the border. We, we actually did make it home um, and the border patrol asked us why we were coming back to Canada. And I said, take a look at this. And he said, welcome home. <laughs> I'm home back with my children and they are the best medicine. 
my friends come over to visit. First they come in masks and then they just get into bed with me. And being back with my kids is the best form of healing in medicine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, basically, I'm really grateful to be here with you today on the other side of the mountain sharing my story with you. And I hope it was helpful in some way. Thank you for the opportunity. And clearly, I should have practiced. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you for, for sharing your story. Um, our, our next speaker uh, to share her story on her high grade neck is, uh, or sorry, her men one patient story is Amber Luciak. Hello. Hi. Oh, yours is so moving. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Amber Lusiak. Your story was so amazing. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the CNS team for putting on this conference and inviting me to share my story with you today. When I first saw Jackie's message to me asking if I would like to do this, I immediately said, no way, because I don't like to do public speaking at all. I've tried to avoid it my entire life. Um, but there's something to be said when you're as fortunate as I am to have supportive people around you. When I mentioned this to my best friend, she told me that I had to do this. And she even booked a flight with me to make sure that I would come today. Um, the month of May has been very challenging for my community because we were evacuated from our homes nearly three weeks due to wildfires. So I prepared this presentation from the hotel room that we were living in right up until Wednesday. So it's been very uh, overwhelming. I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, I founded the Canadian MEN support group, and I have also helped to admin the distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy group on Facebook as well. Where do I go? Where is it? Hmm? This one? No. Um, I've designed this special ribbon for those living with MEN, and I've also started a blog called the Amber Lucy Project. Um, if there's anyone here today that has MEN, I brought some stickers. You can come find me at the break and I'll give you some stickers. This is my family tree. Uh, we've traced our family history of MEN back at least three generations. So everybody in orange on this um, is affected in my family. Uh, um, my grandfather had MEN, my mom and her two sisters have all passed away from it, and myself and my brother have been genetically confirmed to have it, as, along with some cousins. Um, my mom had recurring kidney stones and high calcium. Um, she also had something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is when tumors produce high levels of gastrin and make excess stomach acid that causes extreme GERD and diarrhea. This is my mom. Um, my mom was my hero, and she always told me that there was always someone worse off than you, especially when I was feeling sorry for myself. Although she faced a multitude of challenges in her life, she never wanted pity at all. She pushed herself to be 
a shining example for her kids. And she woke up every morning thanking God for another day and went to bed each night saying, tomorrow will be a better day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nervous okay <laughs> um <clears throat> thank you um my brother started to get weird symptoms at an early age he said he felt dizzy noise and sound bothered him and eventually he wasn't able to attend school he, uh, it took the doctors years to figure out what was wrong with him the only thing that ever picked up his pituitary tumor was an mri which he finally had when he was 11 years old. It took about three years of that. He had a prolactinoma that had grown so large that it was pushing on his optic nerve. It was a very stressful time for a family because it took so long uh, for them to figure out what was happening. I didn't want to cry <laughs> for this whole thing, sorry. It also affected his testosterone. Thankfully, they were able to put him on a medication to help shrink the tumor, though it made him feel quite ill. And he had his entire pancreas, gallbladder, and spleen removed in 2018 due to peanuts. I'm not good at public speaking. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you a timeline now of all the things I've been through. Um, so, by the time I started to have symptoms, I was already in my 20s. I was scared because I was having kidney stone pain. It was the worst pain I'd ever experienced up until that point. Uh, the endocrinologist was telling me that my calcium levels were climbing and I'd probably need parathyroid surgery soon. I suffered with a kidney stone for three weeks trying to pass it before having a basket extraction. The pain from that was worse than the stone. And I decided I never wanted to have a kidney stone ever again. Uh, so I opted to have all parathyroid, all four parathyroid glands removed and one transplanted into my arm as suggested by the surgeon. Uh, so not long after that, I was scheduled for a total parathyroidectomy and auto transplant. The surgery should have been very straightforward, but I woke up with a raspy voice and found out later that they had to carefully cut away one of my parathyroid glands that had wrapped itself around my vocal cord. It was a relief to me because I got most of my voice back and I do like to sing. Uh, the transplant didn't really take and the post recovery of this surgery was terrifying because the, sur uh, the surgeon purposely let my calcium levels bottom out to make sure that they got all the glands. I went into tetany many times over the next few days. He also didn't put me on calcitrol, so my body wasn't able to absorb the calcium that was crystallizing in all my veins by IV. I was covered in bruises. It was such a horrible experience for me. And after a while, my calcium started to climb anyway. Uh, so after my parathyroid surgery, I had to take large amounts of calcium and calcitrol and was having blood work done quite regularly to make sure that it was being absorbed properly. I noticed that I was very anxious. I never felt that way before my surgery, but I was experiencing panic attacks and some episodes of hyperventilating. The hyperventilation was causing some tingling similar to the tetany, so that just put me into a tailspin. Uh, the trauma from the surgery was messing with my emotions, but I now know that low calcium can cause feelings of anxiety as a physical response. I've never experienced panic attacks or hyperventilating ever again after my calcium come up to normal levels, except for today. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, then less than a year later in 2007, I started having uh, new symptoms. So about two hours after eating, I would start to tremble and sweat and feel very weak. My doctor decided to do an ultrasound and CT of my pancreas and showed a one inch mass in the tail of my pancreas. And I was scheduled for a three day fast in the hospital to see if my tumor was producing insulin. 
Um, I was in a heavy fog after the surgeon's admin person told me over the phone, Amber, don't you know that you have cancer? Yeah, these words hit me like a freight train. I was only 28 years old. I had a, my whole life ahead of me and I just met the men of my dreams. I had the career I always wanted and this couldn't be happening. So I was depressed for about two weeks and then my, boy, my boyfriend suggested that I go to church with him and I was always uh, resistant to do that before, but this was scary. So I thought, why not? I remember trying to think positively about the whole thing. And I thought that they would be able to just scoop out the tumor and I get on with my life. But I was quite surprised when I was told that they would be removing most of my pancreas and my spleen and possibly part of my liver. The surgeon showed me a colored picture of some organs and started to cross things out. And was explaining to me how he was gonna connect it all back together with parts that we were seeing. That was surreal. I finally decided that feeling sorry for myself was nowhere, no way to live out the rest of my days. So I shook off that feeling of hopelessness and start to look for the good. And I decided to th uh, throw a going away party for my spleen. So I invited all my favorite people and um, asked them to make a page for my scrapbook about how we met and our friendship and everything. And soon after this, um, my boyfriend proposed to me. So, and that was exciting. I was scheduled for a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy for that June. So we had no time to waste. We decided to have a small wedding 13 days after his proposal. My husband-to-be quit his job, moved in with me the night before the wedding. Everything was happening so fast. I didn't have time to buy a wedding dress or anything, but we had a beautiful small wedding. <laughs> Okay, um, my surgery was 16 years ago. I was extremely nervous beforehand and in so much pain afterwards. I guess they were having trouble managing my pain. I was on a morphine pump for several days as the epidural that they had planned didn't work out for me. My surgeon did an excellent job. I was very fortunate not to have any leaks. Um, I did end up with an infection that opened up my incision. They had to clean and pack my wound from the inside out. So my recovery took an extra month because of that, but I was able to still do a lot of short walks and thankfully was given digestive enzymes to be able to eat without too much pain. We watched a lot of comedy shows together and played lots of games to keep my mind occupied too. Um, I went back to work about four months after my surgery when my wound was almost healed. I struggled with digestion and uh, fatigue quite a bit, but found immense joy in being given a second chance. I didn't realize that my diet wasn't very clean and I wasn't taking enough enzymes to digest my food. So I learned pretty quickly that I could, uh, I could also control my blood sugars by eating a lower carb diet. And I learned how to ride a motorcycle. I didn't let anything stop me from living my life to the fullest. Uh, the following May, so 11 months after my surgery, we bought a house and I found out I was pregnant. It was, uh, I was extremely excited and a bit worried as my belly grew. I didn't know what would happen to my scar, but it was fine and I had an amazing pregnancy and a beautiful son. And my mom was so excited to be a nana. And then uh, about five years after that, we were snowshoeing and all of a sudden I experienced uh, that familiar thing that was ha happening before my surgery. I felt like my blood sugar dropped very low, very quickly. And I started to sweat and shake. And so after that, I started to carry snacks with me. I went for more tests and they found more tumors in my pancreas. My endocrinologist has been trying to get me to have the remainder of my pancreas removed since then. And um, I told him that we want to have another child. And then 
and then my husband was diagnosed with testicular cancer. <laughs> so we didn't end up having any children after that. So it's been hanging over my head that I would have to have the remaining part of my pancreas removed. And I've been having yearly testing. But I've been very fortunate that um, my peanuts have remained stable. And then, and then my mom passed away. And then, sorry. Um, in 2015, I had most of the parathyroid transplant in my arm removed and experienced tetany again after that surgery, even though I spoke at length with the surgeon ahead of time about everything that went wrong the first time. And then in 2016, I contacted the NIH as I found out that they had a clinical study for those who were genetically diagnosed with MEN and had hyperparathyroidism. It took some time to get there, but my brother and I traveled to Maryland in the fall and stayed for a few days and went for a battery of tests. We were each given a schedule with the tests that we had done. And they were very thorough, and I learned so much about what kind of condition my body was in. It was pretty overwhelming, to be honest. I think there's such a thing as knowing too much about what's going on at once, right? And so there are little things all over the place in my body going on. So it kind of stressed me out, but I realized that there wasn't much I could do about a lot of the stuff. And I was, and worrying was just gonna make things worse. So I decided to concentrate on the bigger issues first and what was actually in my control to change. And then in 2018, I went back to the NIH for the gallium 68 test and other various tests. Again, overwhelmed by the amount of uh, information, I was able to use it to make more tweaks. I increased my vitamin B12 and vitamin D supplements as they were drastically low. Thank you very much. And then in 2017, um, I decided that I needed to clean up my diet and lifestyle. So I went to see a functional medicine doctor who specializes in individualized lifestyle changes and helped me to identify foods that were causing my body to become inflamed. He measured the inflammatory markers in my body and then we worked on ways to reduce the inflammation by uh, removing certain foods and chemicals in my home. Things drastically improved for me during this time. My daily headaches disappeared, the rash on my face and upper arms were gone, I had less pain overall, and my digestion was way better. It was about after 18 months of this that I had another EUS, and there were only four tumors in my pancreas when there were six the previous time. So I knew my hard work was paying off. And then I started to get really passionate about helping others live better with chronic conditions. And I started a blog to keep track of all the things I was trying and what was working for me. And then most recently, uh, the past five years have been more of the same. I have a quite a bit of pain from the, um, my high PTH and calcium levels, so mobility is harder. I'm dealing with fatigue and really bad GERD lately, but still trying to stay, stay on top of my lifestyle changes that I made. Not because they'll cure me, but because I feel better when I do it. I'm being investigated for high cortisol and aldosterone levels as I have, uh, I also have an adrenal gland tumor. Uh, perhaps this will address my weight and blood pressure issues. I will be researching different ways to support my body until I cannot put off surgery any longer and I still do not eat gluten or dairy, and I've been experimenting with things like intermittent fasting, sauna, castor oil packs, all of which I'm loving the benefits. And then I have a special little thing for you guys. Um, I have my seven ways to live better with cancer, so. Number seven. Um, never stop asking questions and seeking answers. If something isn't working, I try to figure out why or how I can make it better. I learned about my conditions so that I can make informed decisions and advocate for myself. There's no shortage of information out there. Learning about your own body and how it works is incredibly empowering. 
The knowledge that I've gained over the years has prolonged my life. Because I'm in the driver's seat of my own healthcare, I have been able to actively seek out certain testing and treatments that I may otherwise not have known about. Number six. Can you guys see those? Yeah. Okay. Assemble your healthcare team. <clears throat> I'm not afraid to ask questions about how to make things better for myself or ask how, who I can recruit to be on my team. I've disagreed with some of the treatment options that I've been presented with over the years. And if someone does not honor my decision to deny a certain treatment, then they are not on my team. I will also seek out alternative medicine supports in addition to traditional treatment. And I have been quite successful with the results. Number five, find somebody to talk to. Cancer is hard, no one should face it alone. If you do not have a support system in place, you need to build one. There are support groups organized by our very own CNETS group, as well as others on social media that you can join, and counseling available at most local churches. I know that mental health supports can be expensive, but there are resources out there if you know where to look. Number four, change your diet. Change your diet. Change is hard, especially when you're extremely tired and sad and sick, but make small changes, baby steps. Each time you buy something, try to find a better version of the previous thing and the changes will add up. I promise it's worth it just to feel a little bit better and to have more energy. And it also helps you to feel like you have control over something. Number three. Don't feel sorry for yourself for too long and always look for the joy. Regina Brett said, if we threw our problems in a pile and saw everyone else's, we'd grab ours back. Yeah. Preparing for this conference was the first time that I've taken stock of everything I've been through. So it's tough seeing it all like this. And I don't like to think about it. Um, aside from doctor's appointments <clears throat> and distraction works really well as a coping mechanism. <clears throat> so you probably will be grieving your old self, but if you can change your focus to something outside of yourself, like a project, a hobby, or helping others, it will take the spotlight off of what's wrong with you. Um, and this is the best time to look for joy. Uh, number two, we're almost there. Um, make self-care a priority and be gentle with yourself. What this looks like is different for everyone. For me, it is connecting with people when I'm feeling well or having a long bath and puppy cuddles when I'm not. I've learned to say no to things to make sure that I'm not over committing myself. I get fatigued easily and I know I need to put boundaries in place to save my energy for healing and recovery. And number one, don't lose hope. And my faith has grown immensely. And I used to feel like a tiny ship trying to navigate a huge ocean by myself. And when I learned about Christ's love for me and the comfort that comes with it, it was a huge weight off my shoulders. I learned that there are some things that I can control, but most I cannot. So I gave my problems to the one who can. And that's the quote. And I just want to thank you all for listening and I hope that my story will benefit you in some way. Feel free to reach out to me on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber, for, for your bravery. You did a great job in sharing your story. And our final patient story uh, this afternoon comes from Ornella Guida uh, to share her experience with high-grade neck.
Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone. Um, oh. I'm sorry, I don't have a slideshow for you. I'm just gonna read, and but I am nervous. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ornella, and I'll be sharing a bit of my cancer journey. Sorry. I've been married for 30 years to an amazing husband and a mother of two beautiful girls. Family is my everything. I've always worked to provide for them and my career has spanned across many different industries. I met my husband as a waitress at a banquet hall, welcomed my first daughter as a stock manager for a construction company and welcomed my second daughter as a customer service representative for a furniture company. I've always kept myself busy as a mother and my children are my full-time job. From ballet lessons to tutoring sessions, the parents in the audience will understand life was busy. Thankfully, my daughters have grown up and gone are the days of the after-school activities. I am so proud of the strong women they have become and careers they are building. My eldest got engaged this past February, so I had a wedding planner to the career list. As you all know, the pandemic brought the world to a standstill and completely altered the way we lived. For me and my story, I believe the pandemic was a blessing in disguise. In June 2020, I was diagnosed with net. I just had returned to work after the first wave of reopening and was experiencing abdominal pain that would come and go over the course of five months. I would explain it as, oh my God, I was just tired or exhausted, but this day was different. I had decided to go to the hospital after work because I had never experienced this pain before and it had gone on for long enough. I was asked to return the next day for a CT scan, which uncovered a 13.2 centimeter mass on my liver. I can remember the exact moment I heard this news. I was by myself on the phone with my husband when the doctor asked me why, what brought me to emergency. I explained the continuous pain I had the day before, and he told me the biopsy and more testing was needed. Heartbroken and devastated to hear this, I was admitted to the hospital. Those were the longest days of my life. During the pandemic, there were no visitors allowed and you were isolated in your room. Patience, strength, and many phone calls to my family and friends is what kept me sane. After two long weeks of waiting, we heard the appointment to hear the results of the biopsy. My husband and I met my oncologist, Dr. Shaquille Kassam at South Lake Stronic Regional Cancer Center. Days of anxiety and tests were submitted up in three words, you have cancer. Tears filled my eyes, and these are no words anyone wants to hear. Dr. Kassam spoke to us with empathy and carefully explained the biopsy result, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma stage four. Dr. Kassam fully explained what type of cancer I had. He even drew a diagram to show where my tumors were. I was told the cancer originated in my lungs and gallbladder, which gave me the diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. Oftentimes, once this type of cancer is uncovered, it's usually already spread to other parts of the body. Immediate treatment was required. No time to mourn the loss. No time to mourn the life I had being diagnosed or the hair I would soon lose. We had a plan in place and I was pulling every ounce of strength I had for myself. The following week, I started six rounds of chemotherapy. After being poked one too many times, I discovered my fear of needles. I made the decision to get a portica. With this diagnosis, I was also given immunotherapy treatments. This form of treatment uses the body's own immune system to fight off the cancer. After six rounds of chemotherapy, the tumor had shrunk by 80%. The largest tumor had shrunk to less than, 30 cent less than three centimeters from 13.2. This was the light at the end of the tunnel for me. Heinz said, I had come to learn that my diagnosis is not a tunnel, but a path that will have both light and dark. It was now October of 2020 and we were still keeping our circle small. My family was home with me every day and my friends would drive by to see how I was doing. I'm forever grateful for my support system and they truly gave me the strength to keep going. Six months after chemotherapy treatment had concluded, a tumor on my abdomen wall started to grow. In March of 2021, I started radiation. I completed 10 rounds and the tumor shrunk. During this time, I continued with my immuno therapy treatments every three weeks. After a year of putting in the work, I spent 12 months living my best life. 
no longer held back by chemotherapy and radiation sessions. I was able to travel and boy did I travel. We took a much needed vacation, family vacation to Hawaii. From Niagara Falls to Montreal, I took every opportunity to get out and live. In January of 2023, my scans had shown that the same tumor had grown. Dr. Kassam had met with us to discuss our option. He told us that chemotherapy was the favored option and since enough time had passed, my body could have, could have taken it. After more discussion with other doctors and accepting the fact that I would lose my hair, Dr. Kassam suggested that we try radiation first. With 10 rounds of radiation completed, the tumor had shrunk by 60%. While this isn't the best outcome and fight is never truly over, I have learned on this journey to celebrate the little wins, so I'm going to leave you with some of them. Immunotherapy has been a successful form of maintenance for me and my cancer is reacting very well to it. I have a wonderful team of doctors and nurses over the past three years have looked after me. I would love to shout them all out by name, but there are too many and I will just say thank you to the entire team at the Stronic Regional Cancer Centre but especially Dr. Shaquille Kassan. I am part of the Toronto Nets Zoom support group, formerly held at Wellspring, who have been there for me during this whole journey. Out of love, people would say, I know you have, I know how you must feel, but they never truly did. The support group listened, offered advice, and understood the emotions I was feeling, and I'm forever grateful for the lifelong friendships I've built with them. And I've had the pleasure of meeting them today. Thank you. I had the opportunity to receive a makeover on the Maryland Death Show after losing my hair in May of 2022. In December of 2022, I was able to share my story with Sophie Ash, who was featured in the National Post to bring light to immunotherapy and small cell lung cancer in Canada. And finally, the opportunity to speak to you today and the experience has been a highlight and I'm truly grateful. Cancer has affected most of us here personally or through family and friends. The word cancer holds so much fear and when faced with uncertainty, you can choose to fight. And in the past three years, I've learned a lot about myself and I am a fighter. Thank you to the CNET Society for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really glad to have you all here and so appreciative for hearing your journey. So maybe one more big round of applause for these brave ladies. And Fortunately, we don't have time for Q&A for this session, but I'm sure uh, if, you, if you have questions, uh, I'm sure any one of our panelists would be happy to chat with you. Our next session uh, is our Ask the Experts, our roundtable sessions. One of our most consistent findings in our conference evaluations is that you can't get enough time uh, to ask questions of our experts. So we've kept one of the most popular sessions from our previous years. Our three medical experts from, from our earlier session uh, will be around for the next little while. I'll ask them to spread themselves out around the room uh, so that you can join them at their table and ask questions. But I would ask that you are respectful of time and just keep yourself to one question to give others the opportunity to ask their questions as well as our speakers are popular. Uh, just in case you choose not to stick around or for those on our live stream, I will give my closing remarks now. So once you get your questions answered, um, you don't need to stick around to hear me later. So again, thank you to all of our amazing speakers this afternoon. We really appreciate your time. Um, one other note is uh, we do really value your feedback on these sessions. We do have a survey. The link to the survey is in your package. Uh, so if you could please complete the survey to let us know what you liked, what you didn't, topics you'd like to hear in the future. We really do want to make these sessions as value, valuable for you as possible. And then of course, we hope to see you all back here tomorrow where our agenda continues with more great speakers, more great panels, uh, and more opportunities for you to interact with each other and with our experts. So on behalf of CNETS, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you've learned some new information that will help you navigate your NETS journey. Uh, and so with that, uh, the, the round table or Ask the Expert sessions uh, will start. Feel free, feel free to move around. Thank you.